Action Park Media. Welcome back. back. Uh, we're excited here. I mean, listen, you know, he doesn't need an introduction to this Highly audience. Highly anticipated guest. Three straight <laughs> Emmys. Three straight Golden Globe nominations, two wins or three wins in a row, too. I, I don't even know. Look, I'm just honored to be here. That's all that matters. <laughs> you guys are the only prolific people during the pandemic, and I just can't believe I'm in the same room with you. Taylor Swift <laughs> as well, by the way. She's going to win nine Grammys while this pandemic happens. <laughs> but, hey, so, Jeremy, it's great to have you. It's been yeah. a long time for all of us. that we've seen. I don't remember the last time I saw you. I, live. I, I mean, the good news for everyone is we're all so vain that we don't want to age. Oh. And we're just, you know, we're figuring out how do we stay, how do we not look like a bag of dirt? So I celebrate <laughs> all of you. A lot of moisturizer. For, there you go. Moisturizer. Indeed. Indeed. <laughs> you guys a are all holding strong, very strong. Connolly and Dylan just did a commercial together, and uh, honestly, I saw a picture of them like with the works done, which is fine. But they both, hair and makeup helps. They both looked like thirty. I swear to God, and everybody was commenting on it that they don't age. And then all of a sudden, they were criticizing me for aging. I don't wear makeup, guys. I don't do that. So, Jeremy, you're natural today, correct? <laughs> I, I am. I am all natural. Let me take these sunglasses. Why didn't someone tell me I was wearing sunglasses? <laughs> it looks good. It looks. Uh, uh, through. Put you don't want to be the in douche inside wearing sunglasses, I've guys. Done it. This is why we're, <laughs> I've done fuck. it. So, Jeremy, we had yes. uh, Jimmy Kahn, who I know you know on uh, last week, which yeah. is really exciting for us. Have you ever worked with Jimmy? I- I've never worked with him. Uh, we work out at the same gym because I like to work out with octogenarians. I like <laughs> to be the old, the youngest guy in the room just right. to make myself feel better. And so I've seen him a million times. Obviously, we work with his son. We we love Scotty. And I, I always say hi to Jimmy, and, and he just walks past me. And I finally <laughs> just went up to him in the parking lot. I go, Jimmy, I just have to say, man. I just love you. Oh, thank you. And, you know, I, I always wave to you, and you never remember me. And he goes, well, if you do something that I fucking remembered, maybe I'd remember you. <laughs> <laughs> so I kicked him in the balls. I go, you remember that? Nice. No, just kidding. I, I love that guy, and, and Scott did the show recently, and we love him. Yeah, he crushed yeah. him. He, he's, he's good people, you know? He just turned 80, and he's still going, and uh, hopefully... It's funny. I said to Doug, I was like, it must be great to get to that point where you just don't give a fuck, and you say whatever you want. And Doug said, I think he's been there pretty much as <laughs> Life, yeah, you know, yeah, and he and he's he's a legend, and he figured out how to do it. We don't even know if a guy like that would survive today. Yeah, you know, which is well, it's tough. I mean, you it would gotta, be more complicated. For I don't know if you heard yeah. the episode with him, but Jimmy was talking about stuff he was not shy about getting uh, getting Scotty some Heidi Fleiss girls for his 16th birthday, and uh, that stuff probably <laughs> wow. wouldn't go over well today. You know, <laughs> wow. <laughs> you know, it's funny. On my way over here, I was thinking, what? There's so, the the hard part for us, I think, is trying to narrow it down because I've there's so much I want to say. I want to do like a four hour. We podcast, could do a two parter, <laughs> two, yeah. two, two part holiday special. Everything. It's like the Brady sequel. Sweep, oh sweep, 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 sweep. There you sweep, go. Sweep, two for one. Double sweep episode. Shark bro. Sweep. You know what? The good news for us, we thought because we talked about it. Like normally, I prepare. I go up with questions. I'm like, listen, I know you're for 20 years. We're gonna go like a little round table. It's a round we table. flow and whatever happens, well, happens. You, you know? know what I was thinking about doing is is bringing something up, Doug. That I don't even think these guys know that you would call me up and you would say, hey man, we've got an older a guest spot, you know, can you, can you come in and, and meet with Martin Land, Martin Landau, Malcolm McDowell, Malcolm McDowell, yeah. Yeah. Um, Mike Tyson. Yep. And, you know, it was, and, and even you, I don't know if, I, if anyone knows this, but you even asked me to ask Bono if he could say happy birthday, Johnny drama. Did you guys know I'm this? Glad you yeah, yeah, this? I'm glad you brought, brought this up. I'm glad you brought this up. Cause this was on one. I have like three questions and this is yeah. one of them. Okay, yeah. good. So, there's been some discussions. Brian yeah. Burns claims to be on a first name basis with Bono. He says he knows <laughs> Bono. We talked about it. I don't know if you listened to the episode when we co- when we covered the episode. Brian Burns claims to have had a hand in it. We don't know. We got to get Bono on to figure it out. <laughs> Bono, we need John. <laughs> I'll t- I'll tell you just it's just one man talking, but I'll right. tell you my experience. So I am a huge U2 fan. I'm at, I'm at the concert the night before we're filming. And Doug's, I guess I texted you that. And you're like, okay, well, ask Bono <laughs> if he can say happy birthday, Johnny Drama. I was like, Doug, I, I don't know Bono. I don't <laughs> you know how, how he goes, just get it done. You know, and I just love that you had enough faith in me. That was, that like was very motivating. So our show is, you know, we're in our second season. No yep. one really. Season did. two, episode nine. There you go. But season it. two has not started airing, so people don't really know us that well. And, and especially you two, yeah. by the way. <laughs> yeah. So I'm backstage, and I am just stalking him. And I, so I've got my 
eye on him and I'm watching him navigate all these different people and I'm just waiting for my moment and I just felt so creepy. <laughs> and I finally I finally went up to him and he couldn't have couldn't have been nicer. And he was very sweet. He had no clue who I was or who the show was. But thank God, Paul McGinnis, his manager, was standing there. And he said, oh, no, no, I I, I know of you guys. You guys are the underdogs. You know, no one knows about you yet. We were the underdogs. I got you. And um, I was like, oh, my God, thank you. And I I just knew that that wasn't enough. So I kept going, and I went and found his assistant and just kept double-checking with everyone. And then, you know, smash cut to him actually pulling the trigger and doing it. And in it was Espanol. Kind of, mm-hmm. in, yeah. yeah. But I remember saying, okay, wait a second. So you're telling me that between songs <laughs> two and three or one and two, Bono's going to say, happy birthday, Johnny Drama, and we're going to react. He's going to forget it is not going to happen. <laughs> There's a million things going on. He's performing at Staples Center. No way. And then lo and behold, boom, it just happened. It was you, magical. Well, we got lucky i don't think if his manager was there but then i wanted to also make sure that his manager's assistants did it and so we we got lucky and, and that was a big one it. now but yeah it is 1000 percent brian burns moving on <laughs> <laughs> by the way uh, jeremy i think you were with me but in the south of france and yes we ended up partying with him oh like all God. night at some nightclub oh my and God, had a great time he was so cool that's and then really- went right to work <laughs> yes with a hangover i have to say for the record i you know and i Regret this. I think you guys had more fun than I did. Why? 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 Because he was in the office with Rex. And we <laughs> well, were at like parties. And, and by the true. way, as a, as a side note to Rex, um, who I literally just ran into, and I'm not making this up, I was pulling my stuff out of storage. Talking about Lloyd, by the way. God. Yeah. Yes, indeed. Rex Lee plays Lloyd brilliantly. Um, and I'm putting my stuff into my car, and I have a poster of Entourage <laughs> that's framed. And as I'm putting it in, I hear, hello. And I swear to God. And I turn around, that and it's perfect, Rex. by the way. You nailed that. It was Rex and this very good-looking gentleman, young gentleman. <laughs> And they were just staring at me, and I was like, what are the... It just looks like... By the way, it looks yeah, like I'm walking down the yourself? street with, <laughs> yeah, celebrating a picture of us. That's I was hilarious. horrified on so many different levels. Oh, my God. Yeah. Dylan gave me for my birthday once a picture of himself. That's true. I did? No, that's not... <laughs> I'm just joking. But, you know, Jeremy, that's the, the, the Bono thing coming through like that. I used to... I did. I used to bring Jeremy and try to Connolly times two to get these meetings. Do you remember our... One of our bad meetings, though, was Richard Sherman. Do you remember that one? What happened? with Richard Sherman? Was Piven at the Richard Sherman I wasn't a part of it, but I just heard that he had to cancel last minute. That's all I know. That's all I know. You were coming with me. You were a part of it. What happened was... He, I, Doug likes to bring people to run interference. Like, he would do that with me in case it gets uncomfortable. Well, by the way, it's not even interference. What the, the call was, I get a call from Richard Sherman's agent that he loves the show and he'd love to have lunch with me. I'm like... Does he does he really want to have lunch with me, or does he maybe want to meet Ari or drama? You know, so I'm like, oh, I'll get someone to come. So I called you to come. Yes. And very simple story. This is right after they win the Super Bowl, and at the time, even though Russell Wilson has unfollowed all of us on Instagram for some bizarre reason, but I was good friends with Russell. And Richard said, "Let's have lunch." So I offered to pick him up at his hotel, and his hotel was in Santa Monica, and it was a one o'clock pickup. I pulled into the parking lot at one o three, then I was going to get you after. I get a message from his agent. Uh, you're too late. Richard doesn't like tardiness. I'm not joking. And, and I then was, he tweeted it, didn't he? Then I'm like <laughs> sitting there. I get a tweet. Nothing worse than wasted time. I'm not joking. But it was, was also an incoming call. He wanted to meet you. Yes. He wanted to meet, allegedly. Well, it's, wanted a, it's to meet his me. agent setting I it up. I never spoke to him directly, which is the thing I'll always say. The only time it's ever worked out was with Bono. If they go through agents and you got fucking 15 people running interference, you're going to end up in trouble. So I can't tell you what the real story was. What I know is I was there at 103, drove from L.A. to Santa Monica, and he tweets, nothing worse than wasted time. And I think I tweeted back, go fuck yourself or something like that. But Probably something like but, that. No, but <laughs> just so everyone's aware. I did nothing, and I thought it was extremely rude of Richard. But yeah, you were coming with me. We were going to go to. Uh, I was excited. On the shore. Yeah. I was excited. So anyway, but thanks, by Richard. the way, you know, you, you're you're mentioning like maybe the one negative, true, kind true. of like cameo in a sea of professional athletes right. that yeah. you yeah. know all wanted to show up, and we were incredibly lucky, very lucky. And Mike Tyson was one of them, and you brought me in there, and you know, I, I couldn't be. I'm such a big Mike Tyson fan. I'm yeah. sitting there. And then all of a sudden, you know, we're doing the meeting and everything's going great. And then you said to him, you go, Mike, uh, I just got to be straight with you. 
we don't have any money. And, um, <laughs> you know, you're going to get like, I forgot what the number was, and I don't want to say it out loud. Probably 2500 bucks. Probably. Whatever the scale, a yeah. top scale is. <laughs> you're right? going to get scale plus I think I know you made $30 million for Holyfield 1. <laughs> right, but this is 1700 and you're going to work your ass off. And he goes, you know, basically, you know, that would be, a, he goes, that would be incredible. He goes, you know, he goes, I would be honored to be a part of it. Said, you know, said, you guys are so wonderful to me. And, you know, and, and, and he was so sweet. He's walking me to my car, and he, he's with his bodyguard. I'm alone. Why does Mike Tyson have a bodyguard, by the way? Think about this for a second. It's another story. Yeah, it's a whole other story. So um, we're walking, and, and um, he literally says, I'm not making this up. He goes, he goes, I, he goes, I don't understand why you're alone. You should have an entourage or something. That's what he said to me. I go, oh, no, I'm good. He goes, no, I mean, I don't know. He, he kept saying entourage over and over again. Really his bodyguard points to me and goes, Mike, look at look at Jeremy. Jeremy can handle himself. Um, you know I wouldn't be making this up about Mike Tyson because you're yeah. probably going to put this out somewhere. <laughs> he looks at me without missing a beat and goes, this motherfucker? He goes, this motherfucker looks like he's the captain of the Jewish debate team. <laughs> <laughs> How'd you respond? Did you punch him in the face? Uh, no, uh, it hurt me because I... You know, I never made captain. <laughs> I think you look like you're in good shape. And Did my you watch dad, the fight? Did you watch the Tyson-Roy Jones fight? Bro, th- he hugged Roy Jones Jr. more than my father hugged me my entire childhood <laughs> during the Roy, fight. I That's not Roy true. My father was him. I thought Roy was hugging him. Yeah, I, I thought heard, Mike was going easy on him. I was at the 50 ra- bucks well spent. Listen, I was uh, taking part in some herbal medication at the <laughs> ranch that night. I'm outing myself. This is this is weird. No, Doug, now. you don't know Doug's developed a drug problem. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, they're not <laughs> drugs. They're legal. They're legal. I take edibles. Big deal. No, I knew there was something different problem. about you. I'm relaxed. I'm relaxed. <laughs> this is amazing. <laughs> no, I heard. Listen, he Tyson's going to fight Holyfield. That's that's a whole other uh, <laughs> for sure, right? It's the right. only logical. I thought Mike looked great. I was really, I mean, I thought it was dangerous for Roy Jones to be in that ring. To be honest with you, that's what I. Saw. I think Mike let him off easy. You're yeah. right. Yeah. But I think Holyfield's probably five years older than Mike, though, isn't he? I don't know. I don't know Holyfield was behind me on a plane. He looks physically better than all of them combined. Does Not he? even close. Right. Which is what, look, you like these fights, but you don't want to see anybody get hurt. I, I don't know, uh, man. Of course I'll not. watch it. Of course I'll watch it. But I don't Listen, watch every, it. everyone's making a comeback. Even Saved by the Bell. That's true. All right. <laughs> That's that why podcast, we need the reboot. Right? Zach Morris, Mark Paul Gosler did a Saved by the Bell podcast. Doug calls me in the middle of the night and is like, how could, this, how could they be ahead of us in the ratings? I'm like, Doug, I don't. By the way, I love I that impression. Know. That really sounds like it. <laughs> you were stone out of your head on edibles, I'm sure. I, I just love the fact that you guys even know podcast ratings. Oh, my yeah. God. That's oh, just I'm amazing. kidding? D- Doug, I can't believe you got Dylan out of Malibu. Doug cracked this the This is algorithm. all just insane right now. I, I don't like to leave Malibu. You I don't. Really don't. No. <laughs> Jeremy, I mean, I'm telling you, I've been asked to do podcasts for five years. For five years, Jeff Garland started You've with You've done his, a lot of podcasts. No, but Jeff said I should do one with him. I didn't really know what they were until Connolly started this company. And then... He was like, let's do it. And I was like, what are we going to do? And once he got Dylan, I was like, if Dylan does it, I'll do it. I mean, right. we got to have the talent. Now we have a cardboard cutout when Dylan doesn't show up. I don't know if you saw that, but I saw, I'm just honored that he's here in the flesh. Yeah. yeah. He would not have missed this one. Right, we're going to jump around a lot, and that's fine. How'd you get in the last dance? Listen, they came to me because they know I'm a huge fan. Chicago I, guy. Yeah, I'm a Chicago yeah. guy, and I, I've loved those guys forever. And, um, you know, they were just looking for. Chicago people that 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 people knew that loved the the Bulls and I was, I, listen I, you know no pun intended but I ran with the Bulls back in the day I mean and, you know I was with Dennis Rodman until a million o'clock and <laughs> and you know watched all that go down I've I've seen him right. You know, it's you weren't it, on that trip to Vegas with him, were you? <laughs> I, you know, it's funny you say that I was not on that trip, um, but I saw him when he got back and. And I, they they asked me because they knew that I had some stories. And by the way, you guys know that I'm, you know, I, I have a problem with trying to overachieve. I just try too hard usually. And so they said, we just need one 30-second story. I sent them 14 30-second <laughs> stories because I was like, look, I go... There's no way I'm not getting in this. I'll do, I, you know, I try. I'm going to keep giving you options until something is funny enough to make it into the cut. Smart. And nice. then I called MJ's people. <laughs> and I was like, you guys, 
I just want to be a part of. They're like, no, no, we we got you, Jeremy. By the way, it was great. Think- it was great. It was a great surprise to see you in it, and it really was. It was such a great illuminating doc that it was good that you got in there. Did so, you think it, yeah. it showed him in a good light, or or what 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 what, what do you think? I, I at think. The end of the I, day? I, well, look, I I think it it in a time when everyone is trying to be on their best behavior, because we're living in a very fragile time. You know, here's a guy that didn't. Michael Jordan doesn't need to make a documentary. Right. <laughs> you know right. what I mean? He could play golf and have a great time for the rest of his life. He's on yeah. his own golf course, by the way. Correct. <laughs> and he, so the fact that, you know, he shot this back in the day and owned the footage and, and signed a contract saying um, the only way that you can release this is if I allow you to, you know, because that's basically what was the contract. And so here he is all these years later and wants to reveal that, he, to his own admission, has a competition disorder. And as a, as a guy from Chicago, thank God he does. Yeah. Because he won six championships. By the way, there was nothing I saw in that documentary. All, of, all the hype up to it was how bad it made him look. There was right. nothing I saw in that documentary that didn't make me like him more. Because I grew up as a Nick fan, hating his guts. And I was right. like, to be honest with you, when we go to work, just like we did... I was into everybody who's into winning and into competing and into doing the best they can. And not you're not there. Again, we did have a lot of friendships, but we're not there for friendships. And he wasn't on the basketball court like Kobe, who I want to talk to you about for a minute also. Yes. We you will know. not stop till we knock Zach Morris off the charts, and that's the bottom line. <laughs> I, think I, we, I think we passed him. I think we passed him. So I, I, it was, certainly with Jeremy, we're going to go right fucking past that Save by the Bell sweep. episode. Sweep, sweep. <laughs> yeah, by the way, everyone, subscribe. you got to click subscribe. But I've talked about this before. I saw Kobe... In his playoff game, I think it was against Denver, missed two air balls when he was in second year, a rookie, and I was like, this guy has no fear. I love him. And I got a German Shepherd the next day, and I named him Kobe. And Kobe was my favorite player, and obviously he went through some some tough shit also, but he was the guy that was there to focus and win every single day, you know? And yeah. you got to you got to meet him during the shoot, I know. What what went down that day? Everybody asked. I had this picture that I posted of you and Kobe, which he wasn't in the show, but you yeah, started talking. How did that ta- not make the cut, Doug? Well, because, and, and again, Kobe loved the show, and he loved the real Ari, but he didn't, he didn't want to do it until kind of when the movie was coming out. We talked a little bit, but he just didn't want to do it. He wanted to focus on basketball, but he was there, and you were talking to him. What went down that day? Well, first of all, every time I ever ran into him, he was what the Jews call a mensch, a good person. Just, and I, I really mean that. Um, so we were there, and, and because I, I was lucky enough to work with a lot of athletes. By the way, is that me blowing up? I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, my God. That's so <laughs> embarrassing. That's so horrifying. Um, for 30 years, I've had my phone on silent because I'm <laughs> living in fear of ruining a take, and that just happens. Here we are finally getting back together. Um, so... I I see him, yeah, so, you know, you put me, you know, in scenes with Mike Tyson and all these guys that don't really have a reference, you know, for for acting, and I just was honored that, you know, uh, first of all, a director that I'm not going to name right now who said to Connolly, just walk it off, Connolly, (laughs) walk it off! It's amazing that that Jeremy does a Dan Adius that's just on fucking point. That is a great impression. I don't know what to do. You've been invited to set three times. You've been invited to set three times, Connolly. Let's go. Walk it off. Uh, He has a broken femur. (laughs) Walk it off! Okay. So I know that if you get a guy... Feeling comfortable. All these athletes um, have swagger. I mean, they're and they're interesting and funny. And if they just get out of their own way, they're going to be great. So I saw Kobe, and I told Perkle. <laughs> to, Dave Perkle was our DP. Or yeah, whatever. the early DP. Yep. I just said, spin it. You know, just keep it going, which just sounds like your nightmare. <laughs> like, literally tonight, you're going to be like. <laughs> um, so he starts, and I go over to Kobe. In and you're char- mic'd. You're wearing a I'm, wire. I'm right? mic'd. I'm, I'm in a suit. We're ready to go. I'm in character. They're warming up. I go over to Kobe. I go, what's up, baby? And he goes, oh, hey, man, what's up? You know, because the thing about, like, you know, people, like, when they come up to you and they think you're Johnny Drama, mm-hmm. they think I'm Ari Gold. So if I walk up, what's up, baby? They're going to say, okay, that makes total sense. Yeah. You know, and I'm just in character, and I say, here's the thing, man. You're so charismatic. And he goes, oh, thanks, man. And he's just literally <laughs> draining threes effortlessly as he's speaking to me, right? And I go, how come you don't get in front of the camera? He goes, no, nah, man, I don't got it. I don't got it like Denzel. I don't have that. I don't have that. I don't have that kind of charisma. I go, no, you do. You totally do, baby. You you could kill. You could make him look like Carrot Top. You know, whatever I said. You know, I'm just like literally just trying. You know, to and he just, you know, he he's so interesting and calm and fascinating during this entire conversation. 
he's fascinating on camera while telling me that he's not fascinating. <laughs> right. Yep. So that's the irony. And, you know, I, I, I don't know what Perkle's framing was. <laughs> I don't know. I'm mic'd. He's not. He's 6'6". Six, six, I'm 5'2". You know what I mean? So I don't know. I'm Did not 5'2", for the get, record. Can we, just, <laughs> can, we just, can we take that out? What's that? You got to get him to sign off. Is that what it was? Yeah, done? we definitely had to get him to sign off. But honestly, I don't remember. I remember when Jeremy was talking to him. I don't remember ever seeing it or hearing it. I, I like I, the footage. I, 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 re I reached out to you and I said, we got some stuff with Kobe. And you said it didn't work or something like it didn't, it didn't, what, it, all that matters is, you know, we got to be around this guy, right. mm -hmm. you know, which was just incredible. I mean, because we always filmed that, you know, at, at the stadium. And I remember one time when he was injured, I'm sure you guys remember this. And he yeah, came we out, were sitting on that thing, yeah. And no. he comes out, starts popping in half-court shots. Well, remember, he, we he, fed was, him he was bucks. hurt that year. Each one of us bet him 20 bucks that no, he could make a left-handed half-court shot. It was 200 and bucks each. And he had five, I think he had like five shots at it? Was yeah, it? no, it was like a couple shots, but this particular, shots, this was yeah, a different shots. game. The one where, where, where Jeremy was talking to him, he was playing. The, when we had the bet, remember, he was out for the year. He was in the boot. Yeah. And he was launching half-court shots with the boot on And he was, hit, he was all over the rim, but he them. missed all three of them, and he gave us he Yeah, gave he us sent somebody each. out. He like, he walked out. off. I'm like, wow. While we, we were just, filming. I'm like, wow, we just got stunned. Kobe just stuck us for 200 each. I can't believe that. And then, you know, at some point, somebody came out and handed and gave us the money, said, hey, this is from Kobe. Pretty well, cool. Well, yeah. I, I can tell you. I, I mean, had that 200 bucks for a long time, and then I, I <laughs> got a jam, and I ended up spending it. Well, I can tell you, I did not expect it, but the day he died, I couldn't believe how it hit me. I'm not kidding. I was, like, crying like he was a relative. It was really yeah. weird because I don't know how many other athletes that I would have thought that way about, and it, it did. And But as Jeremy said, there was something in him. The guy won an Oscar, okay? Right. Like, this guy was – who knows what his next act was going to be, and it's – uh, always going to be something that... Yeah, you always felt that he was going to always be around. Mm -hmm. There's no way a guy like that's going to... He's not mortal. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it does kind of shake you. I remember one time during a game, because, you know, I was just a really big fan, and and he literally, as play is going on, he comes over next to me, and he's holding his shorts. He goes, let me ask you a question. And everyone's looking at me like, what's going on? I was like, is he talking to me? He goes, well, I'm watching that show, man, <laughs> and you're angry. It looks like you're really angry, man. How do you do that? And I was like, well, when everyone's watching you and you drain a three with time running out and there's a billion people watching you, how do you do that? It's you easier know? to be angry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But he was just like, and you could just see the wheels turning, you know, because he's a student. Anyone that's ever talked to him, he always is very curious about you. How do you do what you do, you know? Because he's always trying to figure it out. And that's why he was so good for so long. And and At 61 I, points in his last game as a 38-year-old what, what I love about him and MJ, which is an interesting question for you guys, is they were before social media, yeah. but it feels like yeah. it feels like they would not have engaged in it the way the guys do today. And for us, I know how big it would have been for our show if we had social media, because HBO was still, you know, it was big, but it was still like a niche thing. This would have exploded it to a whole bigger thing. So, how do you guys? First of all, how do you guys feel about the whole social media and actors using it, and it being so important in your careers now? And and Jeremy, are you using it a lot, or how are you dealing with it? I use it, but I don't know what I'm doing uh, at all. Um, yeah, I you know it's it's a different world. It's a completely different world. Um, and there are people that are hired based on, you know, it's a big variable. How many followers do you have? Isn't that, it's really kind of sick and twisted that that could even come up in a conversation when you're getting, when they're making a decision on yeah, some but, kind of an, if it, I don't care if you're saying one word. But and, it was always, it, it always was, as we try to be whatever we are, artists, it was a business and it always was. And they know that aspect of it can help them. So you can promote things without even using marketing. By the way, like this podcast, we haven't spent one nickel promoting yeah. it so but the they they say they, they did do a study now i'm not obviously it's different with podcasts and that kind of thing but with movies or an independent movie or what have you that that it will not amount to success in an independent film right so if if you don't go with the with the quote-unquote actor and you go with somebody that has a bunch of followers thinking that that's going to somehow blow up your movie that's not happening right i think you need both obviously you need to have the talent and the good product and then have that also but i think what's interesting now is 
Uh, we talked a little bit about it last time, but Philip Seymour Hoffman was an actor who really didn't want anyone knowing a single thing about him. He just wanted his performances to stand. Nowadays, people know your whole personality and stuff. How do you feel about that? Well, it's it's up to you. I mean, I think Dylan was the last guy to actually join social media. Right? <laughs> you went in kicking, screaming. I was real, yeah. I was real late. And I didn't want to do it. Right. And I still don't want to do it. Really, <laughs> Doggy Kevin helped me out with this stuff. Yeah, but yeah. And your girl probably to. helps you to. She's helped me out. For yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> and writing songs about him, by the way. Jeremy plays the drums. <laughs> I have a new girl week. now, by the way. Oh, you have a new one? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. She's very talented, and she writes songs about Dylan. We're going to bring her in and have her play one of them. She's a singer-songwriter. Yeah. She's really good. Nice. Doug, we have spent some money on promoting the podcast. I'm not it's making not fun good. of Action Park Media. I know they deliver. Action. Everyone needs Doug to get it. Doug low-budget comments. I, he gets upset. Again. It's, I listen, upset. E- Ethan, Ethan Supley has... has I'm a, glad you say his name right. Uh, Ethan, a Ethan, has a, Ethan has, a, has a podcast that gets a little more love and attention. Well, it's kind of like HBO. Bigger numbers. It's kind of like HBO. Ethan longer. It was like Sim- HBO <laughs> with the Sopranos and us. You know? Ethan was probably his friend from childhood. I know. We've for 25 years. But as I said, friendships. Who cares? He does bigger numbers. he does. So you wrote him the greatest role of his life, but you're not Ethan. <laughs> yep, doesn't matter. So, but anyway, I know you. I guess what my point was is now you can kind of um, make yourself kind of the thing. And I know you're you're you have a podcast, or you're starting one, or what's happening? Yeah, I started one. I, I put about ten in the bank, and then you know you. It's just been a, a strange little journey. Uh, How so? It, I don't want to bore you with the details. Oh, no, tell us. No, we're on a podcast. Yeah. Oh, Give we're on a po- oh, This is a podcast? <laughs> <laughs> Bro, what's going on? What is a podcast? <laughs> yeah. Give us the short of it. So you wait. No, no. I, listen, I, uh, you know, like you guys, I'm lucky enough to have, you know, relationships with, with people and, 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 you know, you just kick it around and it's so fun and interesting and I, you just get to learn so much. And <laughs> Wait, yeah, you're leaving something out. What happened? No, it's just you, you, you hire an attorney and then suddenly it's just in slow motion. Yeah, like it's it messy for no reason. Wow, yeah, we've been waiting me. for yeah. six months to sign contracts. It's like, no, I, I just I just want to start my po- I've already right. interviewed. But wait, the- who do you need to it's sign like contracts stuff. with? No, like yeah. when you he's saying when you just start to do the deals and yeah, by the way, you guys still don't we have, have a contract. We have not signed a contract. I'm still waiting I'd on like to get contract. paid. Well, by the year. way, I'm trying to pull a Jeremy. You know, Jeremy, we can talk about this for a second. No, this was a good move. Jeremy <laughs> A lot of people don't know this. When the show started, Jeremy said, I will commit to two years, which is not done. I don't know if it is done now because I don't really work in the television business anymore, but that was not done. So the reason being, you sign someone to a six-year contract in case they become an Emmy winner and they have no contract. So Jeremy, you did that. And what happened was HBO said, we can't do it. We can't do it. And I flipped out. It breaks precedent, I flipped out. I called Ari Emanuel and Ari called HBO and said, Jeremy Piven's doing this show, or my name's off the show. And Ari really stood up for us, got you a, a great deal. Because, you know, you, if you had a six-year deal, you would have been stuck for six years as opposed to being... Uh, so how does this happen with a podcast? And why aren't you at Action Park Media where the, <laughs> where the contracts are easy? I mean, oh, they're really easy. I yeah, can't get right. you guys to sign them. Yeah, First that's of all, what I'm let's be honest. I, for, for you kids at home that don't have visuals, I know some of them do... <laughs> It's an amazing vibe here. You don't know where you are from the streets, so you're totally under the radar. And I think I sign with the wrong people. You yeah, did. I do too. Can you get out of it? I can get you out of it. Get, we'll get you over to college. I know a guy. Yeah, well, That's I will have someone. But they, hold on, let's, let's rewind for half a second. Let's be honest, Doug. The reason why I signed a two-year contract is because Dylan and I are the, the elder statesmen, if you will. Mm-hmm. By the time we started Entourage, you know, I had done 40 movies and I had a, a quote and you guys said, listen, can you, can you get about 20%? Will you do it for about 20% of your quote? I said, sure. You know, that's an 80% pay cut. Wow. Yeah, but it's I, a small, HBO does, is they're a little tight up at the top. I yes, mean, they're they great are. and well, they do all those things, but they don't. Now, by the way, I just want to interject one thing. I love when everyone says, you guys, I have nothing to do with deal making. Of course, nothing. I, I just really said, I want nothing. Jeremy, you, get him, and mm-hmm. you figure it out. But by the way, HBO is the best game in town, and the reason Correct. it wasn't that they were tight; it's just that we had a very big cast. Everyone gets the same amount of money, um, even though I'm 200 years old. Doesn't matter. <laughs> they were, you know, they don't give a little of the, and it's all part of it. So what you do is you say, okay, cool. Um, you brought this up, Doug. I never like to talk no, money. No, we want to talk everything. God, leave it to the two Jews to fucking <laughs> talk about money. Unbelievable. <laughs> So, yeah, so I took it like an 80% pay cut, and you go, okay, I'll do all this, you know, no billing, no trailer, no money, no nothing. Just give me a two-year deal. And then after two years, 
you know, well, you had an the, Emmy under your belt, and then mm-hmm. you renegotiate. That's I mean, just like for, an athlete betting on themselves. Absolutely, you know? and for behind the scenes stuff, which Jeremy knows some, but you know, things become contentious. But there was an executive at HBO who doesn't want to put Jeremy on the poster season one, and I'm going. That was weird. No, and I'm going. Are you watching the fucking show? And again, I'm not saying I don't want to talk about breaking out or not. I knew, and first of all, I knew with Dylan when he came into his audition that I had gold. But the what scene, about me? You didn't think? No, the scene. He wasn't feeling you. <laughs> no, but what I, wa- what I want to explain is th- there were a lot of scenes with four or five people talking. And when we shot him, David Franklin shot our pilot, who was fucking awesome. But David did, which was very smart. He covered everything, which was not my style. And I said to David, I don't think we need all this. He said, Doug, you want everything because you want to get picked up. And then you can figure it out later once you do, which was amazing that he said that good advice but Mm -hmm. when we were shooting scenes with the four guys basically you're going to piece that together in editing you don't get to see a lot of masters you don't get to see a lot of things so the first time i knew we had a show was jeremy and Connolly in coy i watched that like a play and i was like holy shit this thing is going to fucking explode. I knew it. And, you know, it's not that the other scenes didn't end up being great also, but I just... Sorry, Dylan, you just weren't part you, of the pickup, You cut bro. me deep, Doug. You, <laughs> you were not part of the pickup. I, I have to say, I love Jeremy. that scene, too, though. That but let's be honest. Amazing. No one is better out of the gate than Dylan. When we're doing table reads, Dylan would... I, he literally, people have to stop. They're laughing so hard. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm scrambling to see where I am. I'm not a fast So starter. everyone at home knows a table read is when we just sit down with the And script. it's Doug's favorite thing <laughs> okay. in the world. <laughs> but you know, Kevin, Jeremy, I, I do a little pre-table read beforehand. I was so about, I'm, I'm actually ready. Is that what you do? Yes, I do. I was about to say, ah, Dylan okay, is now like a little know. pre-table read. So he I can deliver. that cold. Bro, I'm no. always afraid that I'm going to lose a funny line if, if I don't get the laugh. So I want to make sure I get too. that laugh at the table. <laughs> I'm, Kyle, amazed. Kyle, I'm amazed Kyle, I didn't lose. Kali lost a ton of funny lines not, with shitty no, table reads. listen, not necessarily <laughs> with Entourage, but you guys know it, on another show, yeah. or you're on a sitcom, and that joke doesn't land at the table reading, it's fucking gone. Yes. Yeah. So I want to make sure I can you know, get the laugh there, otherwise I might lose it. And by the way, we've all known people who've gotten fired off of table reads, and I'm not saying anyone here would have ever that happened, but every actor out there should know, yeah, take the table read seriously until you win a fucking Emmy. And the you table can reading is want. wild. Yeah. Wildly important, yeah. especially in the early days. Wildly important. Yeah, I don't it, know why, but it is. Well, I think because, you know, that's a much bigger conversation, but people operate out of fear, right. unfortunately, and you don't mm-hmm. have a lot of trust in people. And, you know, yeah. like if someone took a look at me at a table read, they'd be like, is he mentally challenged? Why, <laughs> how, why have you hired this guy? What's going on? And then when they come to the show, they go, oh, okay, he's an actor. Yeah. So, you know, everyone has a different process. Right, yeah. right, right. You and know what I mean? they just gave you the script. Usually they're give, handing you a new one as you, you're reading it. I always, right. by the way, I start to get nervous when the they's start getting thrown out. They, Sometimes I think I'm part of the Doug. team and then all of a sudden I'm just not, you know? <laughs> so for everyone who doesn't know, I've said this often, it's so strange, but my first, which I still have, my first outline says Jeremy Piven playing Jeff Jacobs. Do you know Jeff? I don't. Okay, Jeff was my agent at CAA. So two weird things happened. You, who I then meet, got in great shape. You were in less good shape, I would say. Would you agree with that on Sanders, which is where I really wanted you from? That was the whole energy I wanted. Maybe you, you disagree. I was a fat piece of shit. Is that what you want to say? <laughs> so, you fat and, shaming Jeremy for his <laughs> right, yeah. But what happened Plus is, size, whatever. But we sold this show. There is no Ari. There is Jeremy Piven playing Jeff Jacobs. And what happens is I go into this meeting. I meet Ari for the first time. He walks into the HBO meeting. He takes over. And I go to Lev. I'm like, this guy's a fucking character. You know? And then I go, I, like, is Jeremy this guy? And then I met with you. And you had, you, God, thank God, you transformed your body. You were in great shape. You were, you felt like Ari. You had this, like, Kind of, and I know you're not like Ari Emanuel, and I know you're not like Ari Gold, but you had this kind of, which is what, what I loved about you in all of your work, and it's not that you don't do multiple things. You bring energy to everything you do, and there was something about Larry Sanders was very influential, which I want to talk to you about, on this show. I wanted, Bob Odenkirk was the only thing I knew about agents when I got to this town, and that was like, I was like, how am I going to top that guy? How are we going to figure that out? So... Did you have any thoughts about Sanders when you were coming into this and it's another Hollywood show? Or I was lucky enough to do Sanders. It was my first show out of college. And, and Bob Odenkirk played the agent in Crush It. And, and, and Shandling was an absolute you know, genius. And I learned so much. And speaking of the Bulls, I felt like 
literally I was coming off the bench for the Bulls because I didn't have much to do, but I learned a lot watching that and just kind of being around it and the brilliant Jeffrey Tambor and all that stuff. So by the time we started, it was the first time I made a stand, and you, the rest of the actors in the room will know this feeling. It was the first time they were like, look, uh, they want you to come in and audition for a show called Entourage. And I was like, Entourage? Oh, I had a bunch of buddies that were up to write Entourage, and none of them were good enough. And I was like, <laughs> I was so, I was immediately intimidated. Like, what is this? They're like, behind the scenes, you know, Hollywood uh, exploration. But it's a loosely, it's an homage to Mark Wahlberg's life. And I was like, man, this, it, it just sounded good from the jump. I was like, this is, anyway, and I kind of knew Mark. And so I just knew it would, would be fascinating. And Ari was my agent. So I said, look, I was lucky enough. You knew my work and I'd been on a bunch of TV shows and was, you know, starting to star in TV shows. And this was like one scene in a pilot. That's all we had was a pilot. And it was the fifth lead in a TV show that I thought was amazing. And I was like, I want to be a part of this. But how do I not audition? I want, Mm -hmm. you know, it's like as an actor, you're like, just, this I is tried the, make the everything make the to squeeze the offer out of these guys too. I yeah, because right, that's all we want is respect. This is the moment. Yeah. I want my artistic bar mitzvah right now. Yeah. I want to become a man. Just, and by right? the way, this is this is where this is where somehow confusion goes in, or Doug doesn't really have the power he thinks he had because I, there was no audition for me. I was like, can we get Jeremy to do this? Meanwhile, however, it's going behind the scenes because there's more powerful people. Somehow, you're getting the feeling that you have to read for this, correct? Not somehow. <laughs> I am 1,000%, to use your words, 1,000% getting, you know, they're going to walk away unless you go on an audition. I was like, look, you guys, you know, I, I've been doing this for a while. This is a, is a, is a it's one scene. It's a brilliant show that right, I want to be. It's a great scene, but it's one scene. I've done 50 movies. Mm-hmm. Don't fucking make me come in there and read for you guys. Yeah, do your homework. <laughs> do your homework so I don't have to come in. So finally. I did no movies, and I felt the same way. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but you were you were I did some you stuff. had a great role from the jump. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I, yeah, yeah that's true. But I had a I'm not no, look at number one on the call sheet. Look at bro, I wanted. <laughs> yeah, but but he Jeremy. reminded us constantly about number one on the call sheet. And by but, the way, what were you number two? No, I was number three, I think, and I was number five. All right, but you know what, Jeremy, the Jeremy Doug's I, like anyway. Hold on, let me just finish really quickly, Doug. I, you're here every week. I, you'll never go, see go, me go, again go, ever. Go no, go, go 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 go. No, so I basically said, look, can we just push for a meeting? And they go, look, they're going to walk away. I go, guys, we just have to, you know, if, if we don't, we'll never know unless we, like in poker, you got to for, force their hand. Mm-hmm. So we force their hand. So I, I get, the, get the meeting. So I put the suit on. You know, we're, we're, we're you know, we're in our That's 30s. That's already stepping out of your comfort zone. Yeah, we're in our 30s. Dressing we don't. up for the role. We're right. not, right. you know, guys that wear suits every day. Look, mm-hmm. we're casual people. So I put the suit on and I come in with that Ari energy. You know, unbeknownst to me, as Ari Emanuel, as my agent, I had been a drama tour studying this role for all those years because I got to see exactly the way this guy is. Mm-hmm. And I just knew... I, I, you know, I didn't know anything about how I, how I could play him. I just knew that you got a guy who was so good. Ari Emanuel, I'm speaking specifically yeah. about the actual guy. Yep. He's so good at what he does. He um, is this type A abrasive, over the top guy who is incredibly loyal to all of his clients. You think he's a douchebag and, and running around sleeping with all these women and he's really monogamous to his wife and there's all these dualities going on. I'm going, this guy is fascinating. And if Doug wants to explore this character more, there, you know, it, it could be something... Because all the other characters were pretty fleshed out. You're like, you know, some of my favorite lines, just like little lines of drama, is like, yo, bro, is there anything, any parts in there for me? <laughs> and your heart just breaks, and you're like, oh, my God, that's all, that's all of us. You don't remember mm-hmm. any of my funny lines? <laughs> <laughs> but, I can't think but, of one. You know, is man, Connolly, does, is he always like this? <laughs> he's, he's great in the booth there. He's great no, in the but booth. Jeremy, you're right, and we talk about it a lot because what's happening is, like, before we cover an episode... We go back and watch. I mean, I just started. I wasn't doing it, but now I do it. Um, <laughs> the first and, and, seven ones he didn't watch. And we've seen, but... you remember, in the pilot, you know, uh, ask me who I'm fucking. Who are you yes. fucking? Yes. Mrs. Ari? No, uh, whatever, the model. Now we, you went on that you would go, go on to find out that you're super monogamous and that wasn't happening. Not to mention, 
at one point you had eight kids <laughs> and a bunch of there was like all over the place. By the way, no one even mentions that Connolly during that scene ate about eleven pounds of onions. <laughs> and, and because I was like, you were eating all the yellowtail, and I was it was at ten <laughs> o'clock in the morning. I was like, I can't believe he's eating all that sushi. I couldn't believe it. You Bro, and then you saw it. what happened to me. <laughs> what the mercury? From yeah, when, <laughs> Jeremy, when you got when when the mercury poisoning thing happened, I said. I, look, I'm not a doctor, but he eats a lot of sushi. <laughs> and by the way... Just so everyone knows, Jeremy had a, got sick from mercury poisoning. Some people didn't buy it and whatever. He, he had to leave a... They a, thought it was a fish yeah. story, I bro. Always, he had to I, leave a show on Broadway. and I, yes. I always thought, why would he make that up? When <laughs> he could say, yeah. I have mono. <laughs> it's I an have, amazing thing to come up with. There's 22 other things that you could have had that people wouldn't have argued with you about. So why would he say but, mercury And by poisoning? the way... I know you guys have access to all this stuff, but pop in Robbie Williams, who is the biggest pop star in the UK. Mm -hmm. um, he literally just came out and said verbatim everything I said. But anyway. All right, let's get back to this yes. stuff. Okay, so. That was the sound of people switching over to the Say by the Bell podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so that scene, it's interesting that you, you point that out, the dualities of it, because the truth of the matter is, I had no fucking idea what I was doing or where this was going. I said to you at one point, I said, Jeremy, I can't even tell you this show's going to be good, but for some reason I feel like I know how to write for you. But that line where you say, ask me who I'm fucking, was not written with the thought that this guy never cheats on his wife. It was just I was writing something that I thought sounded funny at the moment with no thought that there'll be an episode two ever. Even though it wasn't specific because Ari was uh, you know, monogamous and... and it was so on point for that character to take a victory lap and have, you know, just victory. promotion. There you go. <laughs> get a promotion right there. Gary Busey, the Gary Busey episode. I, I you're, you're, you're live in fear of every time anyone mentions his name, and uh, uh, for good reason. Yeah. For good reason, everyone. Did you listen to the episode? Are you talking the about the the show episode or the podcast well, episode? Uh, I'm just gonna. We'll get to the podcast in a second. <laughs> okay. But the actual day. I don't know if you remember this. Oh. Everyone's got their their Busey moment, <laughs> but there I am. We're, it's Busey in the beach is the name yeah. of the episode. We're on the beach with him, and he and I have our scene on the water as the water is just you know just like on our feet, right? <laughs> And the sun is going Magic down. Magic hour. Beautiful. Magic hour. It's incredible, right? And, and he's like, I'm going to miss your smell. And he's just like, just, you know, saying stuff that like, you know, and he, and he, and he just was not saying anything that was even remotely in the script. No. <laughs> and I'm just trying to somehow, you know, and the sun is almost down. Because you kind of love that as well. That's a challenge for you. You're like, all right, I'll figure something out here, right? That's like a... Uh... I love it right. until <laughs> until they go, okay, we got to flip it on Jeremy. They flip the lens around, and it's just a little <laughs> peak of light, and we got one take. That's my nightmare. <laughs> and so I just, all I could do was just respond organically, which is you're spinning off the planet, <laughs> and, you know, and just Great try line. to, like, you know, make a reference to the fact that he's making no sense, and then try to slip in dialogue from the show you fucking and, killed it i mean yeah. to me no but i'm serious that moment is kind of like the u2 moment the sun is going down it looks incredible and i do remember it was like we're not going to get this and we have to get it and Busey, honestly i love him he burned two and a half three hours of film i mean right. like he just kept going and going and there was no stopping him kind of like at the podcast what brett ratner did, did to me do you remember yes. Brett ratner? <laughs> yes he we took also, two hours and i had like Two seconds to do my line. Yep. We also said this on the podcast when we covered the episode. That was kind of your coming out party as well, right? The steady cam mm -hmm. shot. You're in. You that beat was up our, on Weinstein. That was our good fellas homage. I, you know, Doug's shot. Doug likes that shot. It's on the reel. Well, I, no. I, well, Julian directed it, but I, I loved everything about it. But I, I just want to go back to that first thing because I want to talk to actors out there who get it. I understand everything about the deal making. Forget that. Once we got on that set, it was like, holy shit, a lot of this show... And of course, you're a lot of it. Was gonna be Ari and E going at each other. That was my, that was my go-to thing whenever I was fucked. When I'm like, I don't know where to go. I know I can just get these two fired up, and it's just, it was, it was fucking magical that day at Koi. I remember watching it, going, "Oh my, this 
feels as good as anything I've ever seen. That's how I felt. I and was eating the onions because I remember it was the it was the albacore with the crispy onions. Exactly. <laughs> so I was just eating the onions, and Jeremy was eating. I mean, he was eating. Well, sushi. well, well the thing is, we both committed first take <laughs> to our. It's like you know what I mean. So it's like you, you, whatever you commit to, you got to keep doing it, take right. after take. But so you we, have a fire did. in that scene, Jeremy. That I don't know if yeah. you can really bring back to remember it. It feels where you and E become friends. It really feels there that you resent the fact that you have to sit there. And while this is a comedy and it's a funny scene, it has a really, to me, a really real resonance to what goes on in Hollywood and to what happens when people bring these people with them. Completely. And that was taking those two worlds and putting them together. And, you know, you got a guy, he, Ari was the adult in the room for these guys. You know what I mean? Because they had to figure out a way to, to make their their livelihood kind of come true. Like, you know, and so Ari represented that and guys like that who are kissing Vince's ass, doing anything to sign him. And then they have to fucking, <laughs> fucking <laughs> listen to the best friend and they resent it. Right. Do you know what I mean? For on many different levels. And that, that was a perfect example of that. And, and usually in pilots, you have to do some, some exposition and all that kind of stuff, but you threw us, into the belly of the beast from the jump. And, and, and I heard that Chris Albrecht, who was running the network at the time, really liked that scene as well. And that's one of the variables as to him. Well, it said really district. a lot about Absolutely. what the show was. It was like these two worlds colliding, these fish are out of water, and now they're in with the big boys, and like they have no place there, and how are they going to figure this out, right? So it said a lot, that scene. Right. Wow. Good and, work, and, Doug. Uh, yeah. You no, know, but I, I'm, I'm really serious when I say this, because a lot of people think I'm trying to talk about the writing. That is when you get the proper cast, you know you can go five years, ten years, because you have guys. I didn't know that Ari would be not cheating on his wife and have all of these type of family stories. That never even entered my brain. But as soon as I saw Jeremy working, Kevin Dillon working, you start thinking about all of the possibilities. Kevin Connolly working. A little bit. You didn't think about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> but I was there when Obama said to me that his favorite show is Entourage. And I was like, there's no, I was just like, this guy is such a politician, <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, I can just imagine it, Ray Romano, hey, you know, <laughs> you know, and, 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 you know, Obama saying that everyone loves Raymond, but that was sure, real, man. It was yeah. real. And then we verified it with Reggie Love, yep. his head of security said, yeah, he used to schedule his meetings around Entourage. I mean, that was the back of the time, like kind of even before, talk about before social media, before TiVo. Yeah. You know, it's like and you couldn't, you know, you had to gather, you know, people on a Sunday evening in, in one room. Yeah. So yeah, Obama did love our show. Listen, when I met Obama, you go through the security check and you're, you're like, we basically wait online, right? And you go in one at a time, you get your photo op. So I wasn't like sort of standing in the doorway, wildly uncomfortable, anxiety levels, my the head was about to split open. I was said so much anxiety. And he's like, get in here, E. That's <laughs> amazing. And he waved and he literally put the his only arm guy who me. hasn't met Obama. <laughs> Did and you it was meet just him, the release of all my anxieties. <laughs> I didn't go he, to he a He put his arm around me and he he knew he, he knew Dan. He's like, Yeah, I love the show. I was like, hey, any shot in getting a cameo? I asked him. It's he's really like, I don't <laughs> think nice. that would go over too well. But, but it's really wild nice. to think about how much the world has changed and the most uh, this progressive, liberal, amazing president who watched this show that if it was today, he wouldn't even he wouldn't even think about saying that, even if he did love it. It just wouldn't happen. So right, it is pretty wild. He couldn't admit to loving yeah. this and show. And we were yeah. supposed Sadly. to go. We had a screening set up at the White House. Ari, the real Ari, was setting that up. We were all supposed to go, and then something happened. Someone got bombed. Something Obama, happened. Uh, Bin Laden, they found Bin Laden, yeah, and they then found we got Bin punted. Laden, too. That was it, which always kills me, because that was, oh, man, I that thought was going to be one of the greatest experiences of all time. So, mm. uh, you know, and, and as a Chicago guy, I'm sure you appreciated doubly. So it was pretty amazing. Absolutely. I, w I was out there stumping for him, and I, I remember being backstage with my mom, and my mom grabbed Michelle's arms and said, don't forget about the arts. <laughs> and Michelle's just like, get your hands off. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, How is your mom? My, thank you for asking. My, my mom is great. Spent, spent Hanukkah with her the other night. She's, uh, she's doing really well. Mrs. And Piven was in the show. We yeah. put her in. That's in the right. Yom, Yom Kippur great. episode, I That's believe. right. Yeah. You Absolutely. know, also, too, for people that don't know, Jeremy's mom and dad are acting theater legends in Chicago, She's right? a coach, That's right? And, very kind of you. Yeah, they, they're, they're, she's an actress, director, teacher, and so was my father. And so, I Jeremy, let's, let's go back to, like, 
your beginnings, your early things, and like, I'd no, I'm serious because actually, I don't even really know it, which is pretty incredible. You're a, you started as a theater actor. I did. Yeah, I you know, um, it's almost kind of like being the coach's son, but I never thought of it that way because even though my mom was the teacher, I just. You know, I, I was in an acting school with Cusack and all these people that, that you guys know, and then ultimately Chris Farley at Second City and blah, blah, blah. That's how old I am. Um, <laughs> but yeah, from the time I was eight years old, I was on stage just doing stuff that I had no business doing. And I never thought of it as a means to an end. We, they just put you up on stage and you have fun. And you improvise and you do scenes and scene study and you just have a great time. And, you know, you just keep going. Cusack becomes Conley can relate to this where your where your best friend just suddenly blows up and you're like well, I don't understand what's happening yeah. like how did that like even, overnight yeah, seemingly, how does that right? even happen like all of a sudden Cusack becomes a movie star with Rob Reiner and I was like he was we're 16 years old what's going on and so you just kind of keep going and I was Cusack's plus one for many years right people crawling over you to get to that guy you know what I mean and, and you were in all you were in all these Cusack movies with him is John making that happen, or you got to go through the same process, or what? F funny you say that, and which l leads me to, to our show. I had auditioned so many times, even for his stuff, he didn't even know, and I you know, would go through the process, and then I'd say, hey, man, I got that role in Serendipity, and then we do it together. We had a theater company. Um, we lived together at NYU. We had a lot of history and all that kind of stuff, and... So, but, yeah. is, but is he pulling the extra trigger or no? You're getting these roles on your own. He's uh, not calling in favors. The only time he called one in was with Cameron Crowe where he said, will you watch my buddy's audition tape? And it was just like all of us that ended up in the movie. And it was just so insane those days. We were like, you know, broke into a McDonald's. And we were like burning a moped, and as the moped's burning, we're auditioning. Right. Just like vandals, <laughs> out of our mind, ridiculous. Wow. No one should have hired us. But we would do the scenes over and over again, improvise, and and somehow get the role. And you know, and yeah, I, you know, by the time I did Entourage, I was forty movies into it, and you know, and, and so I, I've been doing it forever, stage actor, um, and then started a theater company with Cusack and was also on the road with Second City, and so just kind of kept grinding. And, you know, if you look on paper, that's why, you know, you can never compare and contrast your career to anyone else's. You know, I, you know, technically, like, was such a late bloomer, and it's just a matter of not giving up. Right. Just mm -hmm. knowing, like, I got something to contribute, and at some point, someone's going to give me a shot. Right. And... You never, I never, you know, it was Entourage. Yeah. And it was that scene that we were just talking about. It was scene, it was episode seven with Busey in the Beach, J Julian Farina shooting it. You know, you, you it was write episode it. Six. It was episode six. And, I think. And <laughs> that's I didn't think, right? Kyle does, Kyle does research now. He didn't do it for the first time. Why are you cock blocking my story, man? I was on a roll. No. Season one, episode six. <laughs> so, um, and it was just brilliantly written and, and it was just a, a matter of you trusting me and Julian trusting and just, yeah, having a steady cam shot, ending with this massive monologue in, in Malibu, you know, and Ari just having one of these great rants, you know, and, and it, you know, it was a, a huge turning point moment. It was a blast. And you I, broke, broke your phone, I'm sure. How many, how many phones did you break? I you tell you, the, how many phones, phones <laughs> did you destroy over the course of your Wait, well, computers, and, and computers, computers yeah. as well. Yeah, I mean, I can't even imagine. Every, every person, I mean, Wayne... <laughs> Wayne is our producer. Wayne Carmona. is our producer. Oh, yeah. but <laughs> would have a heart attack every time. <laughs> Uh-oh, Pivot's coming in. <laughs> Wait, Wayne hated me. Yeah. And, yes, and, he did. and yet, yes, he there was a love-hate relationship because, right. you know, we, we... He got it. He knew what, what was what. Listen, he knew what was the reality what. is I'm playing a character that is an absolute lunatic. I remember one time screaming and breaking things, and Doug came in and he goes, "I need, I need more, I need more." <laughs> I'm thinking literally, I, I, I don't physically know how to give anymore. I can't without literally bursting into flames. So I'm like, "Okay, I got you, I got you." Like, because I'm screaming, wailing, gnashing my teeth, headbutting computers, and and um. So more. So as I'm doing the take, I just grab a script and bite it and start <laughs> ripping the script apart with my mouth. And Doug's like, that's what I'm talking about. And I'm like, 
you know, you just, you, it was great because you kept pushing it. And there were times when you came in and you were like, are you okay? And I wasn't like being some weird method actor. I'm just, my heart is racing and I'm like a caged but animal. But I knew, listen, I know when you I knew when you were mad at me. I knew when Dylan was mad at me or whatever words you want to use. Like sometimes you feel it like, listen, I'm a, I know me. I see what I see, whether I'm right or right. I'm going to keep pushing it. But I remember <laughs> I'd come I'm in. Right or whenever right. Jeremy, whether I'm right or right. <laughs> <laughs> Freudian slip there, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? Jeremy would do that thing with the, uh, you drink your water when you get angry on your, like, your side. Oh, no, he you, does. By the which way, you did a, in the Jessica Alba scene. Which that's, was side, that's a tell. That's a, that's a tell. That's it's a, a tell, tell from when Jeremy. He's drinking his water bottle out of the side of his mouth. Get out of the fucking way. <laughs> yeah. And, I, and look, <laughs> I know it. But, you know, what you just said before was interesting because it is, you know, the right actor in the right role can be life-changing and for everybody obviously it was but but dylan and and jeremy it was like you guys were were the elder statesmen and to me day one it was like how the fuck do we how did we get lucky enough to get these guys how are these guys not in 50 fucking shows working all the time starring in the things now you did have you had cupid which you start in which was a good show. I mean, people liked it. It just it's some things don't work. Sitcom, a big money network. Yeah, you know, but some things just. You, what did you think of that show? That wildly was. ambitious, and it went really well. And uh, the creator Rob Thomas got an amazing deal after that. And then they tried to redo it with Bobby Carnavale, and you know, so it, it kind of kept having a life of its own. So much of its, so much of its timing, and I think yeah. one of the huge variables about this is we were lucky enough to do a show about the backstage life of Hollywood that really kind of hadn't been done. We had we had the blessing of Mark, who had a great relationship with HBO. There were like all these different yeah. pieces that were in play for us, and I'd never had any real luck before. So that was the first time like I right. you know got lucky. Right. And you know And you, you need just, it. And you do. You yeah. you absolutely need that. And sometimes that can launch things into the stratosphere. And it was And just sometimes just some things are just meant to be. And it was just me- it just was meant to be. It was lightning in a bottle or whatever you want to call it. I, I had a question. I people ask <laughs> me this and I have there's there's a it's two parts to an answer about your favorite episode. And taking you know, like Dylan will talk about some a performance, one of his performances. I loved myself in this episode. It's Dylan's <laughs> usually, line. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> but I mean, amazing. for example, the mushroom episode was miserable to shoot because I'm Irish and I don't like standing out in a thousand degrees with no tree, with nowhere to get any shade. It was a really hard episode to shoot, but the end result, it's up there as one of my favorites, right? Absolutely. Um, and then Sundance was just a blast all around. Uh, th- there's a few. There's anything, uh, performance aside, right? So it's like, obviously, we all have our episodes where we liked ourselves or we, you know, the, the episode favored, uh, favored ourselves. But uh, uh, the bigger, the larger scope, what would you say your, your favorite episode was? Well, or a couple, whatever. It, it's interesting because... I think it feeds into a question that you had earlier when I said, I wish I had as much fun as you guys. And you said, why didn't you? And it wasn't as if I didn't want to. It's just, you know, I had these epic monologues. Mm -hmm. And for me, you know, there's some people that have photographic memories. I, unfortunately, am not one of those guys. And by the way, that's like a gift that I don't have. You know, and there's some people that have that gift and they're not great actors, but they have a photographic memory. Right. You know what I mean? So it's just like, it's a give and take. I'm a dummy, but I can act. Right. So, you know, for me, I have to, every week, I, it had to be like a play for me. I had to be hit the ground running from take one, owning this language and making it feel improvisational. I think one of the reasons you don't get as much credit as you should it with Ari stuff is because it was my job, as you know, to make it look and feel improvisational when it was all written. Mm -hmm. So for me to get to that level, you know, I just had to keep running, 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 running. And so that's just me. You know, I don't have as good a memory as other people do. So for me, I, I, you know, I couldn't kind of have as much fun because I was always like on my game. And then when we were shooting the movie and I was fucking around with you guys and they called action, I remember I just sucked. I was like, I didn't know my line. I was just like, it was like a, it was like, that makes, it was a nightmare. This was the biggest nightmare of the whole shoot that I recall. You and Carla Cugino have a scene, genius actor. And the wrong pages went to both of your houses. And we're talking about a seven, Dylan, imagine you getting this, seven-page scene with just the two of them mm-hmm. in a room, 
And th- I rewrote the pages. I rewrote the entire thing. Yikes. I went fucking. I don't. Doug, who did you kill when that happened? I went question. ballistic. I put my hand through a wall because really, though, my biggest concern I would about love all to have of it. Seen that one. I was like, when Jeremy shows up, I'm, I almost thought like we got to go with the old scene, and it was so much better the new scene. I didn't even know how to come to you and say, uh, "Listen." <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was nothing. It's the the same. actor's ass is on every line word right now, was so. different, and yeah. the two of them had a sit down. Do you remember You've that? You've done day? that to me, Doug, as well. <laughs> Not well, seven so numerous times. times. Not so seven. Two, pa- I'm talking yeah. everything. There's no. But yes. There's no. Uh, this was not, a mistake. It's not though. a coincidence yeah. that both you know you and Piv and I. Oh, I guess I can say right. You guys were <laughs> our big guns, right? And and you guys needed your time to prepare. And mm-hmm. you had that process, and Dylan is the same way. Dylan's choices are made before, and and, mm-hmm. and actors listening and people out there, you know that preparation. But what will count and for you something. guys would actually make fun of the two of us when we were doing. Well, I always Dil- got Dylan's, out of your Dylan's preparation is funnier than mine. <laughs> well, you're you're, you're, bo- you're body body gotta, gotta. Jeremy comes from the theater, so he's got to <laughs> clear the pipes. Yes. Wait, what uh, are you doing there? Is that vocal work? No, like that's what I would do in the yeah. corner, and they would look at me. I would literally be like, but I gotta, but I gotta, but I gotta, but I gotta, but I gotta. Yeah, yum, yeah. yum, yum. Uh, <laughs> like literally doing, because I had to warm up my voice. Right, That's what I did. And it looks like I'm literally having an epileptic seizure. <laughs> yeah. And I just, it's just I what we do. Dylan's got his own thing. Dylan did I would do a big ooga. <laughs> you know, to try and get fired up a little bit. Get a little blood. Love it. And Chad, which ended up on the show. Yes. You know? And Chad Lowe, by the way, in the movie, does a genius thing about actors warming up in the in the scene with you. And he is, by the way, Chad Lowe's another one who's yes. one of the funniest people I've worked with. But Jeremy, I just want to get back to this. Do you remember this? day and then you come in and honestly I think this is the first time we've ever discussed like I don't have a photographic memory and you're giving me two page monologues which watch a lot of TV there's not a lot of people talking for two minutes straight which Jeremy had to do quite often so you walk in and you get like, hey, Jeremy, sorry, buddy, but you got 15 we got minutes. Sa- we got uh, salmon pages coming. Uh, <laughs> I hope you're okay with that. Do you salmon. remember this? Absolutely. <laughs> Listen, even worse than that, that was, you know, I had a history with Carla. We had worked for David Frankel, did mm-hmm. um, uh, Miami Rhapsody together with Sarah Jessica Parker and all that kind of stuff. Right. We, we had played boyfriend, girlfriend. So we, we, it worked out that day. Which was worse, talk about salmon color pages, <laughs> is Malcolm McDowell. They gave him apparently the wrong pages. All I know is I'm doing a scene with him, <laughs> and he it, he he did. He's saying one thing, you're saying another. And I don't even goes. know what he's saying. <laughs> I don't but, remember this. Is this a Vern thing? We got to figure out who did this. this no, is, that comes from the office, bro. Right. It was the craziest acting, and I've done everything. I've done, you guys know, but you know, the last thing you want to do is hear me. Oh, Piven in his fucking Chicago theater. Tell us about it, bro. I've Tell I've had it. white face on with you know doing <laughs> Commedia dell'arte for eleven people. I've done it all, right? This was the weirdest and the hardest thing I've ever done in my life, because you know, well, oh, oh, yeah, well, fuck him. What the fuck is he doing? <laughs> oh, I'm looking at you, fucking Harry. You know, and 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 Harry. and. and, and <laughs> He's, <laughs> it's just madness coming at me, but you, um, Lev was on the set that day, and Lev goes, look, here's the deal. We need to get your side. We're going to get Malcolm his, the, the lines for this scene, Ugh. but just give me your side. I am so, so fucking not remembering so, any of this. It's so weird. I'm literally playing the scene without any real dialogue coming at me, just giving him my response. And th- was there this, an actor there, or is he it was scripty? he was he was there, and he was kind enough to just kind of uh, you just know a co- just commit to <laughs> right. gibberish, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. And so we just kind of pieced it together, and like, but that's kind of what you do. You just kind of like, but that's what we did the, the whole show. It's the antithesis of 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 really what it was in terms of everything was written by you, you know, and we you would we would have these in, incredible locations where we're in can. We only had one take. We're at the Lakers. We don't have very many takes. We had to just put any fears, doubts, whatever aside and just totally commit every time. And we were, you know, we were very confident with that. And I remember we'd get directors and they'd be like, well, how are we going to do this? And we're like, no, 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 we, we've been here before. We, we got can do this. it. Yeah. Let us handle this. <laughs> the can yeah. scene's a good one to talk about since you guys were all there. I mean, you got people, nobody knows who really you guys were in France at the time. Cannes Film Festival is actually happening. Clooney 
Angelina are like right there, and you guys. They gave us what one moment to to well, nail I, this I remember, thing. I remember the details because I rem- this is why I remember the story. They they said to us, George Clooney is going to be the last one off the carpet. How they knew that I don't know. When George Clooney walks off and that door closes, you guys have th- we will hold the photographers. You guys have three minutes. So we're lined up in the car, and I, I, I my remember, if you guys remember, we went there earlier in the day and we mm-hmm. rehearsed. Yeah. We knew our march. Yeah. I was like, okay, nothing crazy. We each have a couple lines, nothing crazy. But when we got there, <laughs> it was so loud, and this is what we didn't account for. It was so loud, you couldn't hear anybody. Mm-hmm. So it was hard to pick up the cues. So you were reading lips, and I remember thinking, fuck, man, we, I don't think, I think we missed it. We might be stepping on each other or whatever it was. And then sure enough, we you go to sound. It. And it was boom. crazy. I mean, you had me climbing over a fence. And picking <laughs> oh, up that's the girl right. And you had to climb over the fence. <laughs> if, I, if I got caught up on that fence or if I took a fall, that was that. Right. Was that you know, anything right. Like that. If you didn't make it over that fence, that's, that, that's shot. Yeah. Did you like working like that? Because we did a lot of shit like that. Live oh, at Liker it. Games and... You know, as an actor, you're trying to recreate feelings. You're on a set, you know, what do we, okay, what's it really like? And using substitution and blah, blah. But when you would put us in these situations, like you would have to be a terrible actor not to be able to, you know, pl- play off of Kobe, you know, ripping yeah. the rim down. We were, you actually put us in these situations. So I loved it. I love being a can. Mm-hmm. Like you don't, you don't have to act. You're there in, Clooney just walked off. You're in the belly of the beast. Just be. Just be present to all Pivot, this. Pivot, greatest be- quote to Wayne Carmona. You know what, Wayne? You fly me halfway around the world to give me a, a baguette and an army cot. <laughs> <laughs> all right. But what happened was, <laughs> what, what happened was, what people don't understand is, yeah. it was, we got to the, it, we were so late. Listen, those can is booked up for years in advance. Right. Two weeks before, they decide that we're, that we're, we're going. We get the green light. There's no hotels available. We squeeze Great. into a hotel. But you remember, we're all, <laughs> we're all getting dressed in the same... It was like a locker room. <laughs> we're all getting dressed in a little tent. Jeremy's like, this is crazy. And I, by the way, everybody knew it. I felt... I was feeling it too, but you were vocally like, this is crazy. I mean, the guy flies us halfway around the world, <laughs> gives me a bag, getting an army cot. We're all getting dressed. We're all in here naked. I can't uh, fit my Emmys in here. <laughs> I, I've, I've never said that, but I that's funny. God, no, I tell you what I couldn't fit in my room was my bag. <laughs> Bro, I'm not kidding. I think my room was different than yours. I, th- I thought I was on punked. I literally thought... You were so fifth on the call sheet. I was fifth on the call sheet. <laughs> I had a sweet and, and I had a, It wasn't even an army cot. It was like a single army <laughs> cot where it was like a singlet. And then it was like, you know, I couldn't quite fit in. So I like called up the Martinez. I was like, do you guys have any rooms here? We have one. I'm coming over. Boom. And I went... And 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 so yeah, oh, I, we man. don't we don't need to go funny. there. That let me funny. let me. I, I digress because <laughs> the reality is, people think that we were all in these scenes together every day and every. When the reality is, you know, we had two different lives, and you guys. Yeah, were, Kevin was yeah. saying that before you came yeah. in. You know, like I, you guys didn't have a, a ton. Well, I tried yeah. to. You know, Usually, I have I have a hundred thousand entourage photos on my computer, and I can legitimately go Kevin Dillon and Jeremy Piven to find every picture that you're in together. I found one of the two of you alone. Just one. Like if I put you and Kylie, it'd be 500 and blah, blah, blah. So you guys didn't get a lot well, of work together. I think we together. had one scene alone together. Is it the one I'm That's talking about? you were talking about. Are you yeah. serious? It was one scene? Alone. I think, I think so. It, it was such a it. strange scene that I didn't even remember. And I watched it this morning. Uh, drama there would always be someone else in the scene. And, and also, Jerry and, and remember you and Jerry had one sort of awkward well, scene, wait, so and you f- and Dylan. Yeah. Well, let's well, talk, so you, drama comes into you to to basically ask if you believe in him and want to work with him, or if he should move on. And, and you and, say, "Go ahead, go." Yeah, but not like that. He says it in. He a says caring, it with a heart. Yeah, a real so, heart. Yeah, though. It was, it's, it's, it was do you remember a that nice scene? Yeah, it was. It, and by the way, if if you did the show today, the conversation with drama would be something about. You know, drama would be like, you know, I, you know, I, I was up for that guest spot on, you know, this is us, and I, and I'd be like, drama, they're going with someone ethnic. <laughs> That's true. You know what I mean? Are you still in my office? You know, whatever. I mean, it, right? Yeah, it would no be, doubt. it would well, be, it would be interesting to see how we did this. But I, I wanted to stay, focus on some of the things that people think like we're doing this big giant show. Do you remember the pilot and the Ivy scene? Oh my God! Yeah. So I mean, I. Took my car, got a cameraman. We had no permits. We had no approval from HBO. I said, Jeremy, you can take it from there what you remember. I said, go walk in the Ivy, make a reservation, and then do the scene. Well, I mean, listen, I came up doing guerrilla filmmaking. You know, I'm making movies for no money, and that's exactly what this felt like. 
and we had no permits. And um, you just go, Jeremy, go run across the street and just play the scene. Just walk towards us right now. We have one second. And so I just ran across the street, and I'm like, you know, it be, you better be a fucking Scud missile heading towards us, Yoko, or I'll choke you out with a fucking strap on or whatever. You know, any, any one of those Ari lines. And literally, you know, one take with us just stealing that shot, and it was... We got oh, okay, it. Okay, because I don't it. know if I've imagined this. Did did you almost get hit by a car? Am I fucking crazy? One thousand percent. I mean, I, mean, the fact I remember that, going, "Oh my god, I'm going to go to jail." Well, okay. I mean, because for me, you guys know as actors, you're yes, you're aware of everything around you, and you're playing off of everything, but you got a ton of lines, and you're squeezing it in, and you got to get it all in, and you only have one take. So yeah, I almost got killed, <laughs> and it, it, it's all you know. Gary Goldman, even even poor Gary, you know. <laughs> oh my God, the fact that he stayed with us and uh, was our first AD for forever, and Adrian still thinks that I don't know his name, but I do know his <laughs> name. Let's be honest. Well, I was I was actually going to get get back to Connolly because I don't know. I haven't seen every episode. Have you guys talked about when he directed or no? Uh, a little there. bit, but we can talk about who's directing. Do you, do, you, do you remember when you were directing and, and Carla Gugino and I were doing were doing a scene in a restaurant? Yeah. And I have to fucking lose it. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it's so interesting because you brought up, you know, we're in Cannes. No one knows who we are. We can navigate. We do our characters. We used everyone on the street, you know, um, as extras, uh, background artists. <laughs> and um, so we just, you, you know, it looked like a $100 million movie and we just, we just ran with it. But now here we are, you're, we're, what, season eight? When, it's we, season seven, the one you're talking about. Seven. And it was our first 10-page day ever. We're in there, and I'm losing it and screaming at Carla. And every background person is just watching me and laughing. <laughs> and, and, you know, it, it, hey, you guys, just so you know, I'm this random guy, and I'm, you know, we're causing a stir, and I'm yelling, and it's not pretty. Just can we just react to this? But guy? also too, you're drunk, right? You get drunk. I'm just drunk. You have that Al Pacino moment and yeah, say, say goodbye, goodbye to the, to bad, the guy. bad guy. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I'm drunk and I'm yelling at her. And you know, by then everyone, you know, a lot of people know the character. So the more angry I got, the more drunk, the more they laughed. Right. And it was just hard to actually shoot it. And then Doug cut my favorite line because uh -oh. Uh -oh. because uh -oh. I, I, I I fed Jeremy a line. Because I thought it was funny, and Jeremy did it, you know, which he didn't have to do. But remember, you're like walking out, and then you're like, and you're not the real Wolfgang. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had it in my cut. That's Doug it. cut it. I'm like, Doug, why would you cut? Well, I'm I can tell you why Wolfgang. I cut it because it, it, the real restaurant w was in a lawsuit with <laughs> with the real Wolfgang because that was Wolfgang's wow. where we shot it, and we would have been. I was I already was sued funny. by uh, Bob Evans at one point, and then Johnny Bananas at another. So we had a, you know, you know. By the way, Johnny Bananas, Bananas is going to do a podcast at Action Park yeah. Media. Could by the way, er, it sounds like really, everyone huh? sounds like everyone except for Pivens doing a podcast here. Are you going to offer the guy a fucking podcast or what? <laughs> like, get him out of this legal. Well, you could be a nice recurring for us. Uh, we love having you on the show. There you go. This yeah. is great. Yo, are you Adam Malibu now? I, I am out of Malibu. You're out of Malibu. I'm, I'm in a trailer park in Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> um, Rancho, you love Rancho Cucamonga. <laughs> <laughs> it's a love funny Rancho. Name. Every, listen, you're, you're still every Malibu, time right? I'm looking at a map or I'm driving and I see Rancho Cucamonga, I think of you. For there, you go. <laughs> there you go. Um, so, yeah, to get back to the fact that, like, you know, you guys had a lot sexier locations than I did. Right. I'm usually, you know, in the, in the office rolling calls with Lloyd or getting yelled at by the wife, Perry Reeves, who played Mrs. Ari brilliantly. Mm -hmm. um, and so w one of the times I was with Lloyd, Rex Lee, um, I, you know, Doug would, would, every week I would go, oh man, this is, you may have gone too far. <laughs> every time I would read it, I'd be like, this is the part, I think this is the part where everyone turns on us, or turns on my character. You know, so I would go to Rex, and I would go like, Rex, are you, are you okay? Because it's, it's like dawn. And I'm like, I'm going to say, if you had so much cum squirted in your eyes <laughs> that you can't see what's right in front of your fucking face, you know what I mean? Like, and he'd be like, yeah, what's, what's the big deal? He's, just, he's got as sick a skin as anybody. Anyone. Yeah, he was just yes. like, let's go. Who cares? Yeah. Yeah. Just say it. Why are you even asking me? I was like, well, just, you know, is, this, is it cool? So what's so funny is when people, you know, come up to me on the street and they're like, bro, I'm a fucking douchebag because of you, bro. <laughs> and I'm you know, like, you know, oh, it's, a, it's not a documentary. Thank you, Dad. Oh, um, also, too, Jeremy, the thing about your, about, and this is for people listening, because of the way a shooting schedule works, you can't 
you you do you're at a location and you stay at that location. So what would happen with Ari's character is that we would be at Ari's office for a day and a lot of your scenes, which are very intense. So you'd have, you know, ours would be spread out, right? Yeah. You would have a day of like five, six, like super intense scenes. And that just, yeah. just started the day off, dialing up the intensity of what it is that you had to do, right? Ours were kind of spread out and there was a little, just a little, yours was just crammed together. Yeah. Like, yo, we're shooting 12 pages of, of, Ari throwing things around and yelling. Uh, I remember at Lloyd saying, and "Yeah, let's just shoot the whole season right now. Yeah. <laughs> let's just shoot the whole season." Oh, that was Tim. It's a good one. That's a good yeah, line. Sure, yeah. sure, let's just shoot the whole season. Yeah, <laughs> but listen, it was it, it worked perfectly. Uh, it couldn't have been better because, as you know, you you know, I'm doing my thing. You guys can lay low and gear up for your stuff. Mm-hmm. You guys are doing your thing. Yeah, we all got downtime, which is nice. Yeah, and it was perfect so that I could we could hit the ground running mm-hmm. and execute on the, on the best level. We were, we were joking about our our line producer, but he was voted best line producer of the year because one of the many reasons is that we would get the work done and get it done in, in a timely, you know, the yeah. manner that, on the time and Dennis on Biggs budget. Moved mountains. The stuff yeah. that they, Dennis and Wayne, the stuff they helped us pull off was mind boggling. We were doing the amount of location moves that were unheard of given our schedule and time and budgets, to be honest. So, but I, I you touched on something that interesting that I, I do want to talk about with, you know, cause a show like The Sopranos, where women get beat up, where people are abusing, I don't know, I think, I think Tony beats up the, the neighbor once, and whatever. Didn't whatever Imperioli it is. sit on the dog and kill the dog? Yeah, <laughs> Imperioli kills the dog. So because, and it's a, it, look, just so we're clear, it's a brilliant show, it's great. Of course. But Entourage... Way ahead of us in the ratings as well. Entourage was, was, whether funny or not, was an attempt to be a realistic portrayal of Hollywood, and, and Ari Gold like Ari Emanuel, had a big mouth, but was really a, a, a good person. So it's interesting when you, when you say that. What do you think of, of how they're, it kind of this world turned where they, they decide what art you can say things that Ari... Because that's a question I get every day. Can Ari Gold talk like this today? Well, obviously you can Let's can't. talk the reboot. Yeah. yeah. So like, what, what does that look like today? Right, Doug? Is that kind of the question? Well, What's... it's both. My, my question is, is, I think, obviously, we were nominated for Emmys every year, critically acclaimed, blah, blah, blah. And now there's some look back that revises history, which I find frustrating. They do it with lots of things, whether it's Blazing Saddles or Gone with the Wind. I find that like ridiculous and, and absurd. So my question is, though, when you were doing it, did you feel like, I know you asked Rex those things, but were you like, okay, I, I'm a character, or were you feeling like I'm uncomfortable, Jeremy Piven, the, the person going and saying these things? I just wanted... You know me. I'm I'm, uh, I'm 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 a sensitive person. So I I so me. I wanted just to make sure with Rex because when you yell action, I'm an animal. Yeah. I'm gonna just rip apart everything, and it's you know it's gonna be, uh, you know I'm gonna I'm gonna go too far, most likely, um, and you know Ari was an equal opportunity offender, and there was something ab- about you know first thing in the morning, telling this, uh, you know this actor that I'm, you know, have you had so much cum squirted in your eyes? <laughs> you know, just like, hi, good morning. I'm going to yell. I'm just going <laughs> to be, be, you know, so I was just checking with him. And to, to, to answer your question, you know, it's so ironic. If you look at what's actually doing great in the ratings, making money, all that kind of stuff, people aren't, they're not looking for PC stuff. They're looking to be entertained. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Tiger King, the most un-PC thing in the world, you know, where he The just, list goes on and on. Yeah, exactly. So th- to answer your question, like, how would we exist? I think it, people would be fascinated by it for many different reasons. And one of them is, how does, how do these people navigate this space right now? Mm-hmm. And I think that is kind of fascinating. You know, how does someone who's in a position of power who Absolutely. says things and is an equal opportunity offender, how does he navigate this world? Like Ari Gold would have to change the way he did business, right? Just the same way Ari Emanuel yeah. would. Whatever, well, the real, the real thing is the way he speaks. We're talking about, as I said, you know, one of my, f- you, you asked favorite episodes, and I think about this one episode that, that, uh, I did get nominated for an Emmy for it, but I think about it for more reasons than that because I remember when, Jeremy, I gave you that script, Exodus, where you get fired, and yeah. you and Lloyd have this really like amazing moment that I, that I love. But you called me, you're like, 
you said this is one of the best scripts I've ever read. And then the next day, HBO called and said it was horrible. <laughs> and and uh, Julian and I, the director, ended up on a on a chair at Comic-Con, as we talked about the other day, depressed. And uh, Mark Wahlberg came in as the movie star and said, are you guys crazy? This, this is a great script and it's going to be great. But what it gave us a chance to do was to show this other side of Ari that you mentioned you thought might be there in the pilot, but it wasn't. It, it was not there. How do I even know how Jeremy Piven is going to pull off a totally different thing than anything we've really written before? And do you remember you get that script and, and thinking like, wow, this is kind of a different... Was that about getting his kid into private school? No, this was, about, this was about getting fired and thinking like he's not going to have money and going home to his wife and being humiliated. Yeah. Do you remember when you got that script and, and kind of whether it felt different than sort of the stuff you were doing on this? It felt different, but I had hoped that we would reveal that side mm -hmm. because you had revealed so many different other sides so perfectly that I was like, yeah, he's he's a human being, you know. When when you t tear all this apart, and and by the way, you know, it, you know, it, it is kind of fascinating because all the worlds have kind of come together and blended together. Like, you, there's a book that you wrote, <laughs> you know, which people thought the Ari Gold book that I wrote. Yeah. You know, hey man, gold I, standard. Yeah, the gold standard. Hey man, I read your book, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I Doug Ellen wrote that book. <laughs> you know, I you know, and they're and they're thinking that ideology, and you took that ideology from like um, the Art of War and and Forty Four Laws of something bunch of things. Yeah, yeah a bunch I, of different things. Yeah. And so you know, people get confused that that you know you are that character. And so whenever you play a character, no one is the devil in their own story. So no matter how terrible a character is, you can't judge him. And, you know, one of the things, yeah, I don't, you know, this particular character, everything for him was about the money, everything. And so, you know, he and I had kind of different ideologies and, and, you, and you dig in, but I had hoped that you were going to get to revealing a little bit of his humanity and so when that happened, I was amazed when, the, when Dylan just brought up um, going to uh, the headmaster's office, paid yeah. by Dan Castellaneta, yeah. um, and Lucas Homer Allen Simpson. playing Jonah. Great. Story. That's right. <laughs> yeah. Um, and that, you know, that moment where Ari realizes that he, it, he was the one that stood in the way of his kid, you know, getting an education. And they threw him out of the school because Ari was so over the top mm -hmm. and yelling and they'd had enough of him. And just the idea that his own antics would get in the way of his son's education was, you know, was devastating to him. And, and he got very emotional. And, mm -hmm. and you and I talked and, and we had a little bit of a different opinion on it and about the emotionality right. of it. And you were great. You know, you I let you go. I remember that. I yeah. Let you do and what and you not thought. a lot of. Most people in your position of power wouldn't necessarily collaborate with an actor and go, you know, you're right. Um, I, I, you know, because I really wanted Ari to get emotional there. Yeah. And you thought it doesn't necessarily match up with everything we've seen so far with Ari. And it was I, great. It was yeah, great. it was great. It was your rolled down your cheek. It was amazing. Yeah. I, I actually got emotional when I saw it. Yeah. So, and, there were some things we talked about, you know, you your kind of emotional speech at the bat mitzvah, which was really early on when we saw that type of thing. Yeah. And those moments, you know, uh, we were talking about that bat mitzvah episode, and it's weird because there is, there's a lot of, you know, listen, Ari's a character that says things that, you know, and I don't mean the offensive things, but just says what's on his mind and has no filter and goes that. And we all wish on some level we could be like that. And obviously there's a lot of my personality and life and elements that I put into Ari as well. So you may be Ari. <laughs> I may be. That's why I stay home, so I don't get in any trouble. But, you know, my, you know, uh, Perry was based on, on my ex-wife, and exactly. my son played your son. and Which is why, among other things, those therapy scenes were so brilliant. That's what I wanted to talk mm -hmm. about, the therapy scenes, yeah. because those are some of, some of people's favorite scenes. And even with the movie, when I finished the movie, they Warner Brothers greenlit it. They go, where's like an Ari therapy scene? Like it wasn't in there. And I had to figure out how to somehow get you guys to therapy with all this other stuff going on. But what do you remember about those scenes? Because you were just incredible. I mean, Perry as well, just incredible in it. And it was so real to me. Well, they were brilliantly written. And it was like, you know, a friend of my dad's who was a, a sports psychologist said that wide receivers lived in fear of the perfectly thrown pass 
because when you get a perfectly thrown pass, if you don't catch it, it's all on you. And those scenes were perfectly written. And so it was on us. Like, if I didn't crush it, that's on me. They were, you'd read them and go, oh, man, this is perfect. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so you just had to dig in and do them. And, and Perry was amazing. And every therapist that we had, therapist number seven, wife number <laughs> one, every one of them, they were just amazing. And, you know, it, it, they were all great. And in the movie where I ended up punching that cat picture. My kitten, by the way. Yeah, the picture of your kitten. Text. And you, you have apparently in real life broken some windows, right? I've broken some windows. And, and you know, I watched with my, my, cur my current girlfriend, Sarah, we watched the scene, uh, which a lot of people's favorite is the uh, um, um, you want to live in uh, Agora Hills. Agora Hills. Right. Know? And she watched it. And it's not the lines, but the uh, like he gets angry, he gets this and she goes. Jesus, this is this is you, and I was like, oh, and I really did. I took a look back and said, right. you know, I better calm down. But when you're doing that, is there any part of you? Have you been in therapy, by the way, ever? Yes, I've been in therapy. Absolutely, yeah. I need to go back to it <laughs> <laughs> after this. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, but I mean, you brought that energy into it, and it did to me. It felt like a real couple in a real therapy session that are trying to. Well, I mean, like I said, it was written so perfectly. Um, Perry Reeves, who. As you know, I was friends with. I had a huge crush on Perry. <laughs> uh, she was really into David Duchovny <laughs> and not into me at all. <laughs> and so we were yoga buddies. You know, you always want to be that yoga buddy, best <laughs> yeah. friend. That was a yeah. great position to be in. Anyway, so she auditioned for it and was amazing. And I don't even think she auditioned. I think you called up and said you should get Perry Reeves to play this part because she wasn't even available. She was doing Mr. and Mrs. Smith. I I'm pretty sure that's what happened. Maybe well, not. You said to me, there were a number of people that auditioned, anyone on this list, and she was one of them. Okay. And I said, oh, Perry and I have a great relationship. She's incredible. Right. And she's a great actress. Um, and so, you know, the rest is history. Do you remember, though, that we had, Perry was not available, so we had another woman on set the day in front of the movie theater at the Arclight, where you say, I get, no a, get a cab at Yucca, or whatever right. you say. Yeah. And Perry showed up at the last second. That's I mean, amazing. Wow. Yeah. I, I didn't even know that. Yep. Um, so to answer your question, um, <clears throat> doing those scenes that were, you know, they were so musical and they were so perfect and they built and, you you know, if once you dig in, it's, it's all going to be, it's going to work. And Perry was so good and Perry, to me, felt so familiar because I did have, you know, we were friends and then we, you know, developed even more of a friendship um, as the show went on. But it was very easy to imagine Perry, who wouldn't want Perry as a wife, mm -hmm. let's be honest. And so it just all felt so right, you know, and she was so perfect. And yours was drawn from real experiences. So it just all, it all kind of worked perfectly. You know, Jeremy, I don't know if you've been listening, but we, we've talked a lot about you know, uh, the reboot or, or you know, I, again, it's an idea. I, personally, I'll start off by saying, feels like there's a ton of red tape and it's probably not as easy as we might think. Or and Dylan, I, what do you think about either A, how people would respond to that, and, and B, what, what that would look like in terms of red tape, or if that's even a, a possibility, or what, what do you think about an HBO Max reboot, whether it's a six episodes or, a, or a what, whatever the form it may be? Another season. Two or, seasons. Or whatever, a season, whatever, a six episodes. <laughs> ten what? seasons, Dylan. Yeah. Let's go ten. <laughs> You know what I'm saying. Well, what, what, it, what are your thoughts? Well, it's interesting because, I, you know, I haven't seen you guys forever. So for the past couple of years, I've been doing this stand-up comedy tour. So I've gotten a chance to see more people than you guys probably have. So I get to see, you know, these people are filling rooms who are fans of Entourage and are missing it. So this isn't me theorizing about, I wonder if they're still... Right, you're saying you see it firsthand, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm up there trying to navigate, and they're yelling out lines. Imagine trying to do stand-up comedy. And, right. Yeah. 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 Let's hook it out, bitch! You know, <laughs> is you have Tourette, sir? Thank you. Can we... You know, so you're trying to navigate it. But um, I, listen, I think people miss it. You know, there, there's... Um, they, it's clear, you know, you can, you can get a sense of that from social media and even the people that have been, you know, listening to this podcast, you know, we could theorize all day about how it would be received. What's the climate? Where are we going to do it? Any of that stuff. But, um, 
you know, we it's very clear that we could all jump in as if no time has passed. That would be the easy Agreed. part. Yeah, yeah, that would right? be the easy part. The question is, yeah. Um, now, is there an audience? I think there would be Agreed. an audience. Yeah. I mean, I, I have zero doubt. I, I would never want to do another movie. I always thought, to be honest with you, and I think the movie looked great and everybody did a great job. I didn't think it. I didn't think it should be a movie. I thought we should have done another season, and that's what I wanted to do. I just didn't want to rush it into ninety minutes. We have, again, five characters that I want to see as much as I can of all of them. So it was a little jammed in, but um, I think to watch these guys, as you alluded to earlier, talking, l- navigating through this world of PC culture and doing it in their way. That doesn't mean I would write it PC because I never would. I would Mm -hmm. do this and be true to these guys. And what the show was always to me, which I also want to talk to you about your own personal experience. This show was, I don't even care about Hollywood. This show was about friendship, loyalty, family. And Ari, like I said, he said a lot of stupid shit, but he was the loyal guy. He was there for his family. He was there for the guys and the guys were there for each other. So I, I guess to me, did you have that type of stuff? Did you have an entourage as things were going up? And, and during entourage, did you have a crew that suddenly like appeared or that you needed to take care of? Ever any of that stuff has ever been part of your life? Well, f- first of all, wh- one of the many reasons I knew it would be so good is that we were basing it on, you know, Wahlberg's entourage. And that was incredibly real. Mm-hmm. And there is an E-drama turtle. I mean, we, they all exist, you know, to this day. Um, I never was a big, I was in, you know, an entourage myself. Who's X? Uh, yeah, I wasn't the star in the entourage. Who would um, you have been? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. A the question. drama. You would have been the drama. I would have been, I would have been drama, <laughs> but I was you more, to get there. I was more of like a, um, uh, I was the guy who was making everyone laugh and who liked drama, um, but would take one. For the team, and because I wasn't famous, I could do anything. Right. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And so I could just get insane. Um, so, no, I never... You know, th- there definitely are people that, that come into your life um, and take advantage of you, don't, whatever. But, no, I'm not a big... You know, I'm not a guy that, that you know... You guys usually see me. I'm not yeah. with a no. crew. With an, a crew. I'm never yeah. with a crew. Cool. Um, where did that where did that question come from? Is that out of curiosity? You know what? Uh, to be honest with you, we wanted to talk to anyone who comes on and just ask them if they relate to that at all. Which, by the way, I don't. I have I have fifty friends from elementary school, but I have never been the crew guy. I've never been the guy that wants to walk. You, you have with more this friends one. than anyone I've ever known. I, there isn't. It I, does. Every time I'm in a city, there are <laughs> yeah. people come up to me that are friends with Doug. Yeah. I've I don't even know as many people as you have friends. I, but that being said, I, I was I still. I finally said to one guy, you know, because he kept pressing. It. I was like, you know, if you were such good friends, I probably would know you. <laughs> you know what? I'm the guy. Heard I br- your name and past. I bring lots of group. I bring lots of groups together, but I'm still not the guy. Like, I don't go on the trips. Like, hey, 14 of my friends are going to Vegas. They know I'm not going. Like, they don't even ask me anymore because I just it's not my thing. But I have lots of groups of friends that you know we kind of count on. But I was never a guy who would run around with like my buddy driving me around and my guy doing this, which is why I was hesitant to do the show when it started. And what? No, but you're, you're a very loyal guy. And, and I remember even from the jump, you were like, yeah, I got my first writer. I was like, I hired him. I was like, Oh cool. Who'd you get? And he's a buddy <laughs> of mine, Rob Weiss. And, yeah, and Doug, I go, cool, man. That's it. awesome, man. Yeah. He's like, yeah, he hasn't worked in 15 years. Uh, <laughs> like, he lost oh, his what? mind. Had his oh, spine up. I was like, no, seriously, who is he? And like, no, that's true. <laughs> but and, you the, know, di- the difference in that is I've never been loyal to favors. Rob, I brought on because I believed he was the only person I knew in this town who kind of thought like me, grew up like me, and he, and he delivered, fortunately. I mean, I, I've never been, even with actors, I talked about that. The only time we ever got into a situation where somebody asked me to cast somebody as a favor without an audition was Martin Landau. Do you remember that? Martin wanted his girlfriend yeah. to be on the show. I'm like, Martin, she's got to read. I'm not just jam. I didn't even let my son just have the part. You were the one who said he's really cute and really funny. I put him on tape in you front of Sheila. You Jeremy Reed and, and, and Martin Jeremy Landau's did not girlfriend read. Jeremy never offer. read. <laughs> Jer- just so we're clear. Jeremy never read. Jeremy thought he was going to have to read. He pulled a power move. He I pulled like a it. power move, and it was not, I was not involved in that. It way. was not me. I <laughs> said, <laughs> I want Jeremy on this show, period, end yeah. of story. So it, It's nice to see some, you know, the producers or do their homework for a change. I mean, they, the work is out there. You can see the guy's great. But still, I will say this. The only thing I'll say to Jeremy and to you in this regard, 
I wrote a part for Eric Bogosian based on the Larry Sanders episode. I wanted Eric Bogosian, Mm -hmm. and I get a call from Gary Cole. Like, Gary Cole wants to play this part. I'm like, I mean, it's not what I wrote. It's not the same thing. He said, I'll come in and read. Gary Cole is as good of an actor as I've ever worked with in my life. He came in. I was so uncomfortable. I'm like, you're never getting this. You got this great head of hair. I got 10 jokes about the hair of this guy. (laughs) He comes in. He fucking auditions, and I write four or five episodes for him because of that. So uh, there's two ways to look at it with Jeremy. It worked and it was great, but whatever needed to happen, we needed you on the show and yeah. thank God it worked out. So now you're making us feel really guilty because Gary Cole. All right. Is, Gary is, Cole. Is, I is, roll is, out the is, red is, carpet for Gary Cole. Cause he read. All right. No, I love <laughs> Gary Cole. And Gary also Cole. Too, he by did the way, some, rush it. Yeah, How good was he? Some people don't really care. They're just like, all right, whatever. We'll read other people. You know, you, it's, it's a lot. It's yeah, well, it's a stressful. I'm sure. Listen, I I auditioned for one thing in my life when I was doing stand up. Jesus, I was humiliated, and I swear to God, I said I'll never ever do that again in my life. I was so I've never felt worse about myself than after you were that like audition. Johnny Drama. I right? was. I was. Someone was a black yeah. bear on their phone or something. The I good s- news now. Is I went you home. Can- you can do it. You can avoid walking into the room, and if you put a real good self tape together, oh, yeah. you could get you yeah. could get pretty far with the self. That did not exist then. But I walked in, and and some guy saw me do stand up. Said you're, I, we might have talked about this, but said you're brilliant. You should play this part. I go into the audition. I swear, every guy looked like Brad Pitt, blonde hair, blue eyed, great looking guy. <laughs> I'm sitting there, and like I, I was so uncomfortable. I went home. I wrote a short film, and I shot it. Seven weeks later, I never auditioned again, and oh. and that's not a good thing. You got to grind through it. You guys did it. You guys have gone through all those humiliations to make it where it is, which is, you know, a testament to both your talent and your persistence. And what, so. what, what, am I not here? I know you're not looking. <laughs> I forgot you're, you're in the fucking, fucking room. Booth, this guy. I've been I always, a lot of auditions. I always myself. forget he uh, he acts. You know, Connolly. <laughs> my Christ. my dinner with Connolly was basically. They him. offered me the notebook. He, just they saying. offered you oh. your big wheel commercial. <laughs> <laughs> so I you, did. I did not read for the notebook. How about that? Uh, that's 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 believed in me. Connolly basically threatened me, like if he wasn't going to get this part at dinner. Our first I said meeting. it's too hyped up now. Now yeah. I'm embarrassed to come in and read because there was so much hype. I felt like I was going to disappoint you guys. But by the way, even listening, because this, I do have a point to this. Even listening to him over my shoulder, because what I wrote in the script was a, a Jack Russell Terrier, an Irish Joe Pesci. That's what I wrote. Now <laughs> I want to bring this up to Jeremy because Joe Pesci, just so everyone knows, Academy Award winning Joe Pesci was on the set for oh one of God. Jeremy Piven's most uncomfortable scenes in the history of this show. Oh, God. Do you remember this, Jeremy? <laughs> I don't remember this. I don't remember oh my Pesci God. being on the set ever. Pesci you, was you, there you, for six hours, and it's so weird why he was there and so great why he was you, there. You won't believe... This story will sound like <laughs> I'm taking, or you're taking mushrooms as you're, as you're listening. <laughs> so, I mean, who doesn't love Joe Pesci? He's right. our hero. Yeah. And I'm doing my scene, and I look over, and I'm like, is that Joe Pesci? <laughs> He's at Video Village. Why is he here? <laughs> right? So in the scene, <clears throat> these two cops walk in and they put, you know, a boom box down. And suddenly I'm handcuffed. And these two gentlemen strip off their clothes. And this is the scene. Oh, this yeah. is the right. scene. I, I know the scene. This now. is the yeah. scene, right? So we're we're rehearsing the scene, and I'm nervous because Joe Pesci's one of my heroes. And <laughs> He's a brilliant actor. And um, we're rehearsing the scene, and my hands are, are pinned behind, and there are these two gentlemen, and they've ripped their clothes off, and they're in kind of like banana hammocks, yeah. but they're like crocheted. <laughs> so the whole, it's just like right there, like in your face. And Joe goes, now, nah, can I, if, you, if I may, can I for one moment? And... And, and I'm like, what, what's what's going on here, Joe Pesci? And he walks in, and he goes, and he, and he goes, literally, come on, just you know, just in his face, slap it in his face. I was like, what's what, slap it in my what? And he said, no, right in his face. I go, Mark, what? Where's the direct? Joe Pesci, he's ow, and like literally, it's just like cocks, there's just cocks in my face. It's just a festival of cocks. Do you know why Joe is there? I can't get out of the cocks. Oh, do you Dude, know why Joe is there? I don't know why you're Joe was there. He was friends with one of them. He was friends with one of the cocks. Yes, really interesting. Yes. He was friends with one of the strippers okay i mean it was fantastic and then i didn't even get to have my joe pesci moment i was like okay great and by the way and i'm not homophobic i you know it's just that when you have a lot of cocks in your face you get a little nauseous and so i was i was nauseous nothing against men i celebrate men i love men have you ever seen the picture i'm sending it to you today it's an amazing photo sending it to you today (laughs) but picture of you with a bunch of cocks it's it's a picture of of jeremy like they're dancing for him he's like we'll put it on social media it's phenomenal but pesci's friends with this guy and just so you understand I apologize to you right now, Jeremy, because I'm not even 
even watching Jeremy's performance on this day, I'm begging Joe Pesci to come on the show to the point where after two and a half hours of harassing I'm him, I'm not goes, fucking coming on your show. I'm not coming on the fucking show. And then oh, two weeks later, I'm jogging with my son by the Beverly Hills Hotel, and there's Pesci. And I'm like, Joe, Joe. He completely ignores me. And my son, who's like nine or ten at the time, goes, Daddy, I don't think that guy knows who you are. <laughs> like, I don't think so either. So anyway, keep I going. I also love Piven being handcuffed to a chair and doesn't even get his like Pesci moment by the time he got unhandcuffed. I could I, gone. There, People laugh. I'm still handcuffed. Is Joe still here? And Joe's gone. That scene, right? Joe's gone. I've never seen him again. All I've seen him was to say, just Mark Cox. In his, he was literally like, in his face. And I'm like, why? What's happening? Is like, T.I. in that scene? By the way, that's a wildly underrated story. I can't believe you have not <laughs> that's told amazing. that story. That's amazing. I've never told that story because it, I, I just didn't think anyone would. You guys would, are that's the only ones story. who would believe me. <laughs> You're the only cops. ones who believe me because you were kind of there. But why? Were you? Did you witness that? I witnessed it. I was. I was. Whatever. Again, this has nothing to do with being homophobic. It was an right. awkward scene. It right. was, well, Joe but Pesci, why was Joe Pesci, Pesci directing Cox in my face? <laughs> Joe Just, Pesci was friends with one of the two guys, and he okay. came to oh watch him work. And Joe Pesci, th- by the way. That was his contribution, I one hate, of the greatest actors ever. By the way, I hate myself that I'm blanking on the actor's name. It might have been Andy, but he was a really nice guy. And he may be working for all I know now. But Joe really wanted to make sure... The scene was right. He was not joking around. He was dead serious. He wanted to make it work. So I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy's not buying it. By the way, if if there ever is a reboot, I think that obviously Lloyd has been promoted. Let's be, let's be honest. Oh, for sure. Mm-hmm. Oh, Lloyd, yeah. Lloyd is he running the partner. show. He may he, be a partner. Yeah. Or maybe he's running things. Competition and and Ari's had a fall from grace. Yeah. By the way, Ooh, I, I would like to see I, I would like, like to see Lloyd kind of treat Ari like shit. There's one problem. <laughs> Which I want to talk about. Other. Rex Lee does. I, I don't. I mean, I thought we were pretty close, Rex Lee. But I, I texted him to be on this podcast. He yeah. did not respond. But you DM'd to him. Oh. You DM'd him. I DM'd him. I saw well, it. Seems. Well, it might don't slip different. into it might Rex's, Rex's DM. All right. All right. Maybe we'll. Maybe we'll reach out to Rex again. But while we'll say this is the last thing, and then we'll. Uh, by the way. He did my podcast. I hate to be that guy. <laughs> it's on a shelf. I, it's, maybe on you a shelf. it's on a shelf. <laughs> maybe that's the legal <laughs> problem, though. By the way, maybe, maybe the we problem. can release your release those episodes through Action Park. I wonder if Connolly could buy maybe it well. out. Buy it out from yeah, the other. We're all going to be going to Connolly for work one day. He's going to be running this whole. <laughs> By the way, he, he really is. Man. You should have seen him with this contract. This guy is hardcore man. The last thing I want to talk about, and then Jeremy, we'd love to have you back again because I could go all night. But I don't know if Ew. you've seen any of the social media people because <laughs> I can go all night. Connolly's going to juvenile nonsense now. He's going to childlike stuff. But a lot of people on social media have that. What's the problem with you guys and Jeremy? Okay, I've said it over and over. There is no problem. I, I, again, I do consider you a friend, even though I haven't seen you in years. Yeah. But this is like you don't walk off. I think this show is pretty special that so many people have maintained connections. But that's not normal. So what? just so you could clear it up for the yeah. universe. I mean, look, here's the reality. The reality is if any of us had issues with each other, we wouldn't be here right now. Exactly. Right. We wouldn't be here. Yeah. And we, we certainly wouldn't have been able. I mean, you know, if, any way you look at it, eight seasons and a movie, that's almost a decade. Yeah. You know, you have to really get along with people. No um, doubt. You know, we were all in the trenches together. Right, we're, yeah. we're, we're there's, connected there's forever, tight. for better or worse, right? It is what it is. Mm-hmm. Right. So, listen, you, you, you know how social media is. Like, someone, Barstool kept saying, hey, you know, what about a reboot? And what about an Ari Gold spinoff? And would you do a thing? And so I, I respond, and then it looks like I'm... You know, uh, campaigning for campaigning the for a spinoff, whatever. and like, you know what I mean, and like, right. and, and when you said, "Hey, come do the podcast," I said, "Absolutely, I'm trying to get mine up and running." And then I got so obsessed with this, "How You Live in J. Piven," which is the name of the podcast, and, and, way, and, and right, we're plugging here. it. We don't know if we're we'll ever going to get to hear it. Though. I'll polish them up. A little <laughs> <laughs> Release them in the new year, quarter one. This is the big. Uh, this is the viral clip. Why is "How You Live in J. Piven" not at Action Park Media? No, Doug, don't make this about me. Doug wants to know what the problem is with the podcast. Is that it's stuck in contract land? You recorded a bunch, and it's stuck in contract land. Mm. So it's going to get released. You're going to release it. And I just keep going, guys, I don't care about this contract. Let's just begin. Uh, it's in the balls in their court. We're waiting for the. I was like, who's court? What, what do we, why, why are we not? 
Action you know. Park Media. We release it, and then yeah. we worry about contracts later. Exactly. Donnelly's going to get <laughs> yeah, so no fucked. No doubt. Let's do it before the taxes go up. Right now, uh, well, I think we should all, this year. We should all move to Wouldn't Austin. Nice? We should all move to Austin like Rogan. <laughs> Record and then, at a Rogan yeah, studio. Yeah, exactly. Hey, have you ever... Why? Have, how could you guys, at least you two, Doug, you and I, not so much, but Dylan or Piven, you guys should get on Rogan. Rogan is the... No? R- Rogan's awesome. And he's awesome. And we, we have mutual friends, and, and we... And, He's just one of these guys um, who is so authentic, and he's just who he is. Right. And that authenticity is so is palpable. And, like, he's been doing this since before we knew a podcast. He did it before it was cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah, man, he was, was cool. doing it, and he's a stand-up, and he's a martial artist. And those are all real things. That's who he is. And people gravitate towards that, and he's wildly curious about people so he, his you know the people he has on his show are from every different walk artificial walk of intelligence life. right whatever yeah you know and 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 people you know from all different ideologies and not everyone agrees with these people politically and so yeah i've i've i you know have, have run into joe along the way and he's great and amazing and and i you know never no never done the right, podcast, well, if so. either of you because yeah. you're bigger than us if either of you get on there you just you know you, you just obviously wear a victory pump up, hat pump up how you live in jay piven but talk about <laughs> victory the podcast we <laughs> yeah. need our and everyone out there subscribe and everything else and oh, jeremy here we go here it is i'd love here's the wrap-up this is the wrap-up no hey, i would away, i Doug. would love to do this again because this was awesome Colin yeah. was worried like i'm like we'll get three hours out of this easily no and i, I no could doubt. i could go on i could on. just be like the fifth on the call shit you, you know not <laughs> getting paid anything you know kind of ed mcmahon sitting in the corner you know <laughs> well, the, the great thing is now is Connolly's the meathead. He's the they in this yes. scenario. They, so they, they, we, he's got a lot of work to do, and you guys get out of here. So but we but out, of, out of curiosity, up. who decided y- you you directed this so that you wanted to be behind the glass? Is that no, right? Be well, there. that's actually a good question. The, the way it started was, I mean, there, there's twenty something podcasts coming out of here. There's, there's long forms, there's narratives, and I just don't, I, I can't be committed to be, you know, sometimes I might have to step out. Here's the right. reality. Just something. like just I, like the audition that Kevin Conley didn't want to do for Entourage, he didn't want to be out in front of this. That's not true. I'm out in sucks. front of 50 okay. things, bro. Wait, no, no, no that's things. not it. No, trust I me. I hear what he's saying. He's getting closer and closer to coming out of that booth all the time. All of a no, sudden, he's doing ad reads. I'm like, do happen. I need to come down for an ad read? He's like, I got it covered. Don't worry. I'm doing nice. everything. Hey, walk, well, you walking in like with your arms folded, like mumbling under your breath about <laughs> something that bought somebody that you want to dead or whatever it is. Yeah, Listen, as soon as you guys are number one in the ratings, uh, Conley is going to be front and center. That's what He'll never go behind the glass again. That's what they're saying. By the way, he's like, I'm getting on that fucking poster and and obviously Jeremy got on the poster season one just so you know behind the scenes it was a giant congratulations with, no, with, no but with me having no power at the time it was an incredibly awkward conversation I'm like you guys don't understand what you're doing he's got a two year deal we'll lose him he's there's five guys, period, end of story. And wherever we go, it's going to be all of us. And that's how I feel. So maybe we'll do it again. Who the hell knows? But this was awesome. This yeah. was yeah. really awesome. fun, yeah. man. It was great, Jeremy. Yeah, awesome. thank you for having me. I appreciate Come it. Back. And if you want to talk back. about how you live in Jay Piven on Action Park, you know. We're yeah, he pays big there. money. We're always <laughs> right. I think, yeah. Make sure you get an electric car because you won't be able to afford <laughs> fucking gas. <laughs> I think Connolly is the real Ari. He's the one making all the moves. He is. Yeah. He's an animal. Yeah. That's why I got to be an this glass. I just closed three deals while you guys were He's an animal. He's got to be put behind glass. He's <laughs> yeah. an animal. Yeah. So anyway. Well, thank, thank you very guys. much for coming. Guys, yeah, this was, was awesome. great. And uh, we that wraps up another episode of Victory the Podcast. I'm Doug Allen. You can follow us at Victory the Podcast. Kevin Dillon, a Kevin Dillon official. This is Jeremy Piven, special guest. It was a time of my life. How you living, Jay Piven? How Victory! Jay Piven. <laughs> awesome, guys. Action Park Media.